here today to give you a big hearty thank you for your volunteerism. The City of Simi Valley is based on civic involvement and volunteerism. Thousands of hours of donated time by folks like you is what makes this city truly a great city. Even in these times of difficulty that we're facing with COVID and the requirements that it brings with it, you are out there delivering services that are terribly important to our community, terribly important to our residents, and you're doing a great job of it. I wanna give you a big thank you, a thank you from the City Council, and hoping that you will keep up the good work and continue to volunteer as you have all this year and I trust in the near future. Thank you so much for your service. Keep up the good work. Hello, this is Mayor Pro Tem Mike Judge saying thank you again this year. Over 600 volunteers putting forward so many volunteer hours have helped our city be the city that it is. Without your help, we couldn't do it. Again, thank you very much for all your help. I wish I was there in person to tell you this. Next year we will be. You guys have a great day and thank you.
Good evening, everyone. We'll call the meeting to order. Do we have a um, closed session report? Okay. Uh, tonight, our city manager will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Pledge allegiance to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have a roll call, please. Councilmember Litster? Here. Councilmember Luevanos? Councilmember Luevanos? Here. Councilmember Judge? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cavanaugh? Here. And Mayor Mashburn? Here. Thank you. We welcome you to the Simi Valley City Council meeting. If you have not heard, Governor Newsom has discontinued the regional stay-at-home order and has reverted counties in California to the color-coded tier system. At this time, Ventura County is now in the purple tier, which opens up many of the businesses in our city. We encourage Simi Valley residents to support Simi Valley businesses as much as possible, but we also remind everyone to wear their masks, use hand sanitizer, and wash their hands often. To comply with the limitations on gatherings, Simi Valley joins the other nine cities and the county by holding our city council members, or excuse me, city council meetings without the public in attendance. However, there are still opportunities for the public to participate in this council meeting. The public statements are received via Zoom. As noted on the agenda, the public was encouraged to register no later than 3.30 p.m. today if they wish to speak via Zoom. Written comment are also accepted by email. Those emails have already been provided to the City Council. They will be made part of the record, but will not be read by the City Clerk this evening. Okay, while the stay-at-home order has changed, uh, we are still committed to serving our residents and our businesses here in Simi Valley, and we're open to calls and will uh, assist you in any way possible. So there is a change, it seems to be a positive change, but we're not prepared to let our guard down and we know that that doesn't automatically make it perfectly easy on our business community or our residents at large. The city thanks you for your patience. During this local emergency, the city continues to provide opportunities for the public to participate in the business of the city for their voices to be heard. With that said, we can move on with tonight's meeting. Are there any items for agenda review? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have a supplemental for item 4B, the public hearing on off-street store uh, parking, and we have a supplemental for item 8A. Okay. If I could, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask that on item 4, I think it's 4B, the off-street parking of RVs, I think that's important to our community as a whole because I get tons of emails and calls about that and i would like to table that item until we have public back in our meetings okay I, 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 i'll go ahead and add to that at this time that uh with the covid and the uh, uh different uh restrictions that we're under and the quarantines that many people have been experiencing it's my understanding that a lot of rvs have been used to place people into them to quarantine themselves so I, I think uh, in wanting to serve our community and to help them through this trying time, uh, it would not be a good time to make any new regulations or limiting regulations or even to, to have to bring this up at this time with the public, like uh, Council Member Judd said, not able to attend the meetings. So I too would like to see it tabled. Does that take a motion to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that as well. So should I make a motion then sure. to table it? Yeah, if you agree, that's I, I agree and I'd be happy Mayor, to see May, Mayor, point of order, I ask for discussion on the motion. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, my understanding is um, that this was the, morator the moratorium on enforcement of this 
um, ordinance was way back in 2018, which was way before COVID. Um, and so the decision to not enforce this RV ordinance uh, was a decision that was made way before COVID um, came even you know, to our city and that was impacted by this. So my concern is that if we table this motion, there will still be confusion as to what the state of this ordinance is and whether or not there's a moratorium. I still haven't gotten a straight answer as to who authorized, even the staff report doesn't clearly state who authorized the moratorium on enforcement of this RV ordinance. And I'm concerned that our residents will be confused as to what laws are to be followed and what laws are not to be followed when we don't know who ordered the moratorium on enforcement of this law. And there is participation, uh, opportunity for participation via Zoom, via email, as um, our residents have participated on a number of uh, very important issues that have come before the city council since this pandemic started almost a, a year ago. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion. Mm -hmm. Is it, I'm sorry, I made the motion, but is it, is, should we have a date certain to bring it back or until when, when COVID ends? I mean, what is, um, what is your desire, Mayor? Well, I'd just like to make it uh, not date certain simply because we don't know when we will quit the uh, restrictions via COVID and uh, then we can address it at, at the time that uh, we have less restrictions and the public is uh, available to come and if anything that we do at that time won't have the same impact on the public as what if we even start debating it today, I think would be uh, injustice to the public. Mayor, with all due respect, we have had uh, public comments. Um, this has come before city council previously twice before, and there have, ha have been opportunities in person for in-person comments. In my mind, the reason for considering this at the, uh, tabling at this moment is uh, the, what was brought, I think, by the mayor's comments that this is a special circumstance where we have people who are trying to quarantine and separate themselves by by being placed in, in the RVs. And that, that makes it a special circumstance. Um, and if we were to go forward with a saying to reinforce the ordinance or, or to go start enforcing this ordinance, then there's a class of people then basically would, would not be in compliance who are trying to be to make, be healthy and obey those health ordinances. And so I think that's where, where I see the potential incongruity is, is those trying to stay safe and follow the state mandates and yet not want to be at odds with what the city ordinance is. So that, I, that would be my reason for tabling this until we're through this pandemic. And, and, and that's... Forward. Excuse me. No, that's it. Thank that's you. That's exactly. Uh, I have the floor. Thank you. Um, I I agree with your statements. This is something I know that needs to come forward. I just say that the timing. Our citizens have been going through a lot, and uh, I think this is the wrong time to debate this. And when we can just postpone it till after the COVID, it looks like things are getting better. Let's hope they are and it won't be too awfully long, and then we can put this on the table and, uh, and have a full uh, discussion and come up with a solution. But I want to do everything I can to ease the restrictions on our uh, residents. May I speak? Respectful? Yes. I agree with um, both Council Member Litster and the Mayor. I know personally um, first responders that are living in their RVs to keep from passing any type of COVID onto their families. So I think to take away that option at this point in time is, is not uh, correct. I think we need to wait for this COVID, um, wait for the mass of the COVID to get over or when the vaccines are, vaccines are out there and more readily available. Um, right now it would just hurt our community and, instead of help it. So those are my opinion. Mayor, if I may address the council. Yes. Uh, respectfully speaking, I, I go back to the timeline that this was implemented, the moratorium was implemented and I'm asking for accountability and transparency of our local government. And we still don't know who implemented the moratorium on enforcement of this law. So discussing it right now would not preclude people from using their RVs it would just enforce the law that was already in place prior to COVID. So 
this is not to punish anyone who is using their RV uh, right now during COVID to quarantine. If they're in compliance with the law as the planning commission uh, wants to remain the law, to remain the way that it is, then it's not punishing people who are currently using their RVs. What it does do is insulate the city from further liability for those people that are use that are circumventing the law as written um, and have been doing so since 2018. Uh, for people, I have gotten the same concerns from many of my neighbors who have um, had to go around sidewalks because hitches from trailers that are in, in violation of the ordinance as written since before 2018, um, they've tripped on them. I'm concerned about neighbors that have, uh, that we're gonna face a lawsuit as a city uh, because we have non-compliance and non-enforcement of the RV ordinance, which is one of the concerns that the planning commission stated as well. When you have our trailers that are sticking out with uh, hitches that are blocking the right of way, then that means that we as a city face liability for that. And that is my concern. My concern is for the safety of our residents. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a motion and second. We'll call for the vote. Councilmember Judge and Councilmember Levinos, how would you like to vote? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how we were going to do that. But I'll vote yes. Okay. I, I, I'm voting no, and I just want to clarify, I'm voting no on continuing this, um, this item to a date uncertain. If we're going to continue it, at least we should say based on a specific date, but also because I think this is an issue we need to address now. My vote is no. Motion passes unanimous, unanimously with Council Member Levinos voting no. I move that all resolutions and ordinances presented tonight be read in title only and all further reading be waived. Second. Second. Please vote yes for me. Sorry, I vote yes for me too. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, declaration of conflict. If any member of the city council may have a conflict of interest or any reason why that member must abstain from consideration of any matter on this agenda, he or she should so declare at this time. Is there any one have a conflict on any of the agenda items? No? Great. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, the first item on the agenda is item 1D1. Certificate of Appreciation to Outgoing Members of the Simi Valley Council on Aging Executive Board. And Robert Martin is here for this presentation. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn, members of the City Council. <clears throat> this evening, the City Council is recognizing two outgoing Council on Aging Executive Board members. Teresa Lewis. Teresa has been volunteering at the Senior Center since October 2018 in a variety of capacities. She began as a volunteer at the Rendezvous Cafe and quickly got more involved in the Senior Center events, ultimately getting selected to serve on the Council on Aging Executive Board. From February 2019 to January 2021. During her tenure as the COA Executive Board member, Teresa chaired and assisted with the Arts and Crafts Fair summer ice cream social and served as COA dance committee liaison and recording secretary while on the board. She served as an advocate for seniors and helped support the goals and missions of the Simi Valley Council on Aging. William Fisher, Bill. Bill served on the Council on Aging Executive Board from February 2019 to January 2021 Bill brought him, excuse me, 
Bill brought with him a financial background that played a key role when he served on the Financial Committee, helping the Council on Aging establish its new financial policies and draft budget. He was chair of the Outreach Committee, which spearheaded efforts to subsidize transportation vouchers for local seniors and worked with staff on determining eligibility requirements and distribution process. Thank you, Teresa and Bill, for your continued dedication. We deeply appreciate the exceptional service you have provided as Council on Aging Executive Board members and to, this, and to the seniors of our community. We, we certainly wish uh, we were in a situation where we can face to face with them, but I, I trust that uh, they understand and that we appreciate their service. Would any council member like to make a comment? Certainly, I, I would just like to, to enter my appreciation as what Robert expressed to Ms. Lewis and Mr. Fisher. I know having seen how that committee works, it's a lot of work yet great rewards and greatly, greatly appreciated and, and utilized by our, our senior community. And so, I, again, I just want to, on behalf of the council, also express that appreciation. I would too, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to make sure that I want those folks to know that I'm hoping that they come back to the council because their service on the council is, they did a great job and that council is one of the best councils we have in the city. So I wanna make sure that they know that they, they need to come back and do this again. All right, thank you. Mayor, I too would like to thank um, the outgoing uh, members of the Simi Valley Council on Aging as a three generation household with a uh, senior mother-in-law who lives with me. I know that she and her friends greatly appreciate all the work that the Council on Aging do and all the programs that they do. Uh, and even remotely right now during the pandemic when so many of them feel so lonely. So thank you so much for all that you dedicate of your time and talent to help our um, seniors in the community. Great, thank you. Next item. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 1D2, an honorary resolution to Edward Mazeka for the Wayne Templeton Volunteer of the Year Award. And Robert Martin is also here for this presentation. Good evening. Uh, whereas Ed Mazeka has been selected by the Simi Valley Council on Aging, as the recipient of the 2020 Wayne Templeton Volunteer of the Year Award, following in a tradition of selflessness, devotion to seniors, senior issues, and outstanding services to the senior citizens in our community. And whereas Ed Mazika has served Simi Valley seniors in numerous capacities, ensuring that the growing needs of some of the most vulnerable seniors in our community are served. And whereas Ed Mazika has served as a Council on Aging Executive Board Member and the Executive Board Member Nominating Committee Chair for, the, for two years, as well as a volunteer for various special events, including the annual rummage sale, Bingo Bonanza, Arts and Crafts Fair, and Wellness Expo, and continues to be a prominent, <clears throat> or excuse me, proponent of maintaining an active lifestyle, which promotes quality of life for seniors as they age. And whereas Ed Mazika is committed to ensuring that all volunteer roles and needs are met by selfless, selflessly stepping in to fulfill many volunteer vacancies, including serving as a volunteer meals and wheels driver for the past 10 years, helping ensure homebound seniors receive proper nutrition. And whereas Ed Mazika has led a life of service, including an educator for 33 years and serving as an ombudsman in, Ven in Ventura County, helping protect and advocate for those vulnerable seniors living in long-term care facilities. And whereas Ed Mazika has demonstrated exemplary dedication to various senior activities and special events and as a dedicated humanitarian. Now therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Simi Valley that it commends Ed Mazika as the recipient of the 2020 Wayne Templeton Volunteer of the Year Award and expresses its recognition and gratitude for all that he has done and continues to do for our community. Presented this day, 
25th day of January 2021. Very good. Uh, I feel like we need to applaud. <laughs> so yeah, we need to, to applaud. So hard not to have that here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what an honor to receive the uh, Wayne Templeton Volunteer of the Year Award that's given each year. And I think that's one that you put up on your wall and you keep on the wall. It, it, it doesn't slide under the bed or somewhere <laughs> else. That is one that is really great. And uh, uh, the recognition is well deserved. And I'm just, I'm just sorry he's not here. They can't be here in person for us to applaud and thank. And I mean, ten years of driving for Meals on Wheels and serving as an ombudsman, such critical things. Anyway, I, but and everything else, we are very blessed to have him here in our community. And, and thank you, Ed. Well deserved. May I speak? Sure. I just want to thank him for all of his service to the community. Simi Valley, that's what makes this a great place to live, is all of our community volunteers. Having served on the Park District Board, um, the volunteer hours are just tremendous, about 600 people every year just on volunteering. And I know the city has the same, if not more. We have volunteers in every area, and the, our community does a great job in supporting us, the city, supporting our Park District, supporting our nonprofits. So to be recognized as the Volunteer of the Year is exceptional. So I just want to offer my personal congratulations and thanks for all that he's done for our community. Thank you. Council Member Levinos. Sorry, looking for the enemy button here. Uh, you know, I I, re, I, apply, I just want to um, say the same thing that Council Member Kavanaugh stated that, um, you know, it is the volunteers that make our community so wonderful. Uh, especially during this pandemic. Uh, we've seen so many people step up um, to help all those in need from our homeless to our youth to our seniors. Uh, and I wanna congratulate you for getting this award and the recognition for all that you do. Although we know that our volunteers don't do it for the recognition, they do it for love of the community and love of those who are in need. So thank you very much for all of your effort. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, yes, Mr. Mayor. I couldn't I couldn't say it any better. Councilmember Lubavitch said it. Uh, Ed is a fixture at the Council on Aging meetings. He is when he gives his report and stuff that he does. I mean, I, I'm always just amazed the heroic efforts that our senior volunteers have done since this pandemic started is amazing. The people have been fed meals that have been given in the the sack foods that we get from the continue. You know, the count. Um, can't remember the. Uh, the, the county's uh, basically Council on Aging. All that stuff comes together and the volunteer efforts are, are amazing. So I can't say thank you enough to Ed and I'm very happy he got this award. All right, thank you. Okay, next item. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is item two, public statements on appointments, special presentations and informational reports. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have no public statements for this item. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is item 3A1, appointment of Simi Valley Council on Aging Executive Board Members, and Robert Martin will present this item as well. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and members of the City Council. Four positions will become vacant on the Council on Aging Executive Board when terms expire on January 31st, 2021. The Executive Board advises the City Council on issues impacting seniors and con conducts fundraising activities to support senior programs within the community. The Council on Aging conducted an election at its January 11th, 2021 meeting, and it is recommended and has recommended four applicants for appointment to the Executive Board for terms commencing on February 1st, 2021 and concluding on January 31st, 2023. The nominees are Jean Cecil, Jeannie Mortensen, Clyde Oliver, Edwin Tinkstrom. It is recommended that the City Council approve and the mayor appoint these four applicants nominated to the city to the Council on Aging Executive Board. This concludes the report and staff is available for any questions at this time. Well, I certainly have no questions. Uh, you're a busy man tonight. 
And uh, the only thing I thought was, gee whiz, every time I go over to the senior center, it's not named appropriately. Uh, as council member judge says, they're so full of energy and action, uh, the senior doesn't describe adequately what goes on at the senior center. So uh, thanks so much for what you're accomplishing over there. Mayor, I don't have a question, but just a request okay. um, for, for our incoming managers, uh, our, our incoming board members to uh, consider maybe doing a joint cross-generational activity uh, with our um, senior center and our youth council. Um, I know that some of our seniors uh, often ask uh, grandchildren or children to help with all the technology, um, you know, Zooming and all those things. So maybe at some point in the future, they would consider having a um, cross-generational activity where we have the youth council um, doing something with our senior, uh, our seniors, our council on aging and vice versa. Um, hearing some of the stories that I know uh, a lot of our seniors have a lot of history to share with our youth. I would love to see something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we're ready for a motion to uh, appoint the four individuals. Most appreciative of these four people willing to serve and would love to make the motion if I could. Sure. I will second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Vote yes for me, please. Vote yes for me, please. The motion passes unanimously. And as per protocol, I appoint the four. Mr. Mayor, there are no items this evening under special presentation or informational reports. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is public hearings. This is a time for testimony on public hearings on the consideration of matters as presented on this agenda. Let the record show that due notice was given as required by law and an affidavit to this effect is on file in the office of the city clerk. All comments submitted by email have, been, have already been provided to the city council and will be made part of the record. However, they will not be read by the city clerk this evening. All persons who registered by 3.30 p.m. today will be called on to speak during this public testimony for item four for a period of no more than five minutes each. Persons addressing the city council are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Comments should be limited to matters relevant to the item on the agenda and may be ruled out of order if comments are unrelated to the item. The reports of the city staff relating to these matters shall be made part of the record of this meeting. If you challenge in court any of the council, city council decisions made here tonight, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing. The time within judicial review must be sought is governed by the California Code of Civil Procedure, section 1094.6. Agenda item 4A, a public hearing to consider the adoption of a resolution establishing a traffic impact fee. The reading of the resolution is as follows. Resolution number 2021, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Simi Valley establishing a traffic impact fee and repealing resolution number 2016-04. And Ron Fujiwaki is here for this presentation. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Mashburn and Council members. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Justin Link right here. He's our Principal Engineer of Traffic. He's actually been with us uh, for a couple of years now, but we just haven't had a chance to bring him to a council meeting, B basically because we're all alone here. <laughs> so, good evening again. Tonight, staff is recommending that the City Council adopt the Simi Valley Traffic Impact Nexus Fee Study Update and adopt a resolution increasing the tra traffic impact fee to $100 per trip, effective July 1st, 2021, and continuing the traffic impact fee program until December 31st, 2030. The traffic impact fee was originally established in 1991 and is an ongoing program that primarily funds the construction of new traffic capacity improvements needed to accommodate traffic impacts from new development. The traffic impact fees collected by the city are deposited into a traffic impact fee fund 
separate from the general fund. The fees cannot be used to fund other such items as landscaping or aesthetic improvements, local street widening that does not increase capacity and intersection, drainage improvements, or cannot be used for traffic control measures during a public safety power shutoff event. The current traffic impact fee is $83 per trip. To keep pace with new development and changes in construction costs, the 2014 traffic impact nexus fee study was updated in 2020. The updated study determined that in order to make the necessary improvements to the city's transportation infrastructure and maintain an acceptable intersection level of service, the fee should be increased to $100 per trip. Transportation improvements as outlined in the nexus study are needed when new development generates increased traffic resulting in increased traffic impacts. In addition to the construction of physical improvements, the traffic impact fee fund also funds other transportation related programs, such as intelligent transportation system improvements, such as traffic signal synchronization and other modernization of our signal equipment to make it more efficient at intersections and keep the intersections flowing. There's another program involved. It includes the vehicle miles traveled or VMT reduction improvements, including programs for transportation management, demand management measures such as car sharing or bike sharing programs, as well as traffic calming measures such as enhanced crosswalks and pedestrian safety measures. The fee also funds a portion of traffic maintenance and operation and administration and additional study update costs in the future. The Nexus study update determined that the total traffic impact fee program would cost approximately $20.6 million, resulting in a recommended fee of $100 per trip. Despite the increase, Simi Valley's traffic impact fee remains the lowest of the five largest cities in Ventura County. Finally, as a courtesy, the city regularly consults with the Los Angeles Ventura County's Building Industry Association, or BIA, when considering changes to the city's development-related fees. For tonight's item, to adjust the traffic impact fees, the city has sent emails and had a telephone conversation with a BIA representative to seek comments on the proposed changes. Unless comments by the BIA are made this evening during public comments, to date, no comments have been received from the BIA regarding the adjustment to the traffic impact fee. Staff recommends that the City Council adopt the traffic impact Nexus fee study update and adopt a resolution increasing the traffic impact fee to $100 per trip effective July 1, 2021 and continue the traffic impact fee program until December 31st, 2030. That concludes staff reports and we're available for questions. Okay, uh, any council member have a question for staff? I just have one quick one. Sure. Please, thank you. Mr. Fujiwaki. Hi. Hi. I was just curious as to the price differential between Simi Valley and every other city in the county. Why is that? I think, uh, I don't know exactly, but okay. I think Simi Valley has always uh, tried to maintain reasonable fees for uh, developers, development, commercial businesses, et cetera. And when we, and we still have a fairly good um, network of streets that can accommodate additional traffic. So maybe the improvements needed to maintain a, a good level of service aren't as extensive as in the other cities that are more perhaps built out like Oxnard, Ventura, or Camarillo. Oh, okay, I respect that, that we are trying to make it feasible and reasonable for our developers. Yeah. So thank you. Hey, anybody else have a question of staff? Elaine. Just a couple of questions. And, and that, I think all of us have that question. It, if your report actually said five times difference than what some of the other cities have. Yeah, is that, I, I believe so, yes. It does, and I wondered if possibly it was because it included other assessments. Or, I mean, is it, are, are we comparing apples to apples, I guess, in this instance? Uh, I mean, I, those are the same type of fees being assessed, or would they include well, something else? I just was curious. It's the same type of fee in the sense that each agency has, quote, a traffic impact fee for new development what they include in terms of the fee amounts, uh, the components uh, in, with regards to improvements and things like that 
I don't have those details exactly. Do you know exactly? No. So fair enough. That, yeah. that, and that's fine. Yeah. It was a curiosity. Just as you're giving the giving your report, I did have a couple of questions. Um, how are obviously development comes in? How are traffic projects prioritized when a developer comes forward? Is there a nexus specific to that exact development um, that that road next to it would be widened with those funds, or does it just go into a pot and then the general general usage is, or need is determined? Uh, generally, the uh, money goes into the fund, and then projects are prioritized based on um, the amount of congestion that's occurring at an intersection. For example, uh, an intersection that's going to be or will soon to be operating at level service D will have those improvements constructed prior to an, an intersection that's operating uh, fine right now. So we, we the money is prioritized towards um, intersections that need improvements to maintain a good level of service. It, and I want to make sure it, it can be both. The developer, if they're developing a project and there are there are um, improvements that need to be done specifically to that project, they would be responsible for building those right. as well as putting money into the $100 per trip related to their project to offset traffic that occurs throughout the community. So it, it could be both. Yeah. Very good. And, and did I hear you correctly that, um, that some of those funds could be used for things such as um, enhanced crosswalks? Um, yes. And also, how about bike lanes being, is that something that could also be part? Yeah, it would be part of the, uh, there was a Senate Bill 743 that passed that requires uh, evaluation of what they call vehicle miles traveled. In other words, uh, new development generates new traffic, mm -hmm. which generates more vehicles, more miles traveled. So the idea would be to implement programs that would not encourage as much traffic, enhance your transportation system so you don't have new traffic, uh, encourage and enhance a carpool or car sharing program, bike sharing program, et cetera. Any, any program could fall under the VMT reduction that would reduce the amount of new traffic that, that travels on our street system. That makes sense, okay, thank you very much. Other questions? Mayor, for me? Yes, go ahead, Council Member uh, Levinas. Doesn't the, um, um, doesn't the SB 743 vehicles, um, mile travel VMTs, also um, include lowering the amount of vehicles miles traveled by building more housing um, accessible to workers in the community so there's not such a long commute time? I'm going to ask for assistance from Justin. Yes, Council Member Livinos. Yeah, I can hear myself. Okay. Uh, VMT does actually encourage, uh, or the at least the intent of SB 743 is to encourage development adjacent to existing employment centers. So that would be the intent of the bill. Uh, within this component, uh, there would be an assessment to actually uh, improve connections in transit to meet the goals of SB 743. So that would include improving crosswalks and pedestrian access. Is that correct? That's correct, to, um, uh, to encourage active transportation. Okay, so when we think, because most residents, when they think transportation, they simply think getting in a car. But uh, the, this funding can include infrastructure to protect pedestrians and bikers and people riding their skateboards. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so this funding could be used, for example, to uh, fund scramble crosswalks because that would increase the flow of traffic. Is that correct? Potentially, the, I believe the intent would be to increase pedestrian connection. The intent would not be to decrease vehicle volumes. It would be a uh, sort of a fringe benefit that by encouraging pedestrian travel or at least making the connection better that you could reduce the number of trips, but the intent would not be to be discouraging car trips. 
Well, that would be one of the benefits, right? If we if Correct. we did that, yes. if we yes. made it more pedestrian friendly, so that it would be able to do that. Um, right. I have a question because we have um, you know a couple of developments that we um, approved already, including the one at the um, the old farmers building, and um, you know as I see that being built. And, um, you know, I, I don't recall that we approved specifically, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, uh, you know, additional crosswalks for the people that will be living in that uh, new community to be able to access all of the commercial that is across the street, the YMCA, the schools, things like that. So would this be used for that? Could this funding be used for that to encourage pedestrian usage? Yes, because I, I don't believe that they've actually paid their traffic impact fees. So what they are assessed could be used in that pool of money for those improvements. Okay. And if, if I can interrupt for one second, council member. Um, yes. I recall we did have quite a bit of discussion. In fact, I brought up the potential and realizing that probably wouldn't happen of actually putting a bridge over from, from uh, that new development over to the shopping center. Of course, the, the expense of that would be astronomical. <laughs> but then the, the settlement was, well, let's have a, a very aggressive crosswalk system to get people across there. I don't know the, the final outcome if, if there was any, but uh, i just letting you know that we did discuss it. Yeah, and I, I can address that. Actually, there's a specific plan for that development that does address increasing pedestrian access across the street to the shopping center to the south as well as to the west. Um, so at the when that development is done, we would look at um, pedestrian enhancements that we can make to increase the amount of uh, pedestrian flow between the um, north and south sides of the street as, as well as the uh, shopping that's available to the west of that development. So okay. go ahead, uh, Council Member Levinos. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my other question is about um, you know, the cost, I know that uh, both um, you know, Council Member Lutzer and Kavanaugh brought up, um, you know, the, the disparity in the, in the cost, right, that we have uh, five times the difference uh, for our traffic impact fees. Um, is this where all of our funding comes from to repair roads and, um, you know, repaint the bike pathways and pedestrian pathways, or do we get funding elsewhere? Uh, oh, uh, the funding for maintenance uh, operations generally comes out of the general fund. The, the, the money that goes into the traffic impact fund uh, is not to be used for maintenance. It's strictly uh, VMT programs, capacity enhancements, uh, and roadway improvements, intersection improvements. Um, and, and maintenance is not, road maintenance and things like that are not part of this to be used from this okay. fund. Okay, I just want to clarify because those were some of the questions I was getting from uh, residents and they want to know if, you know, that's what this money was for or where the money was coming from. So thank you for answering that question. Um, and um, I guess my last question is, is this set in stone? Um, you said this is, uh, once we pass this ordinance, this goes through 2030. So does that mean that the fee is set in stone for the, you know, the $100 fee that that's it, we can't raise it ever again? Um, until 2030? Uh, no, it's not set in stone. The, the fee uh, can be changed by resolution. Uh, and I believe the fee can also be increased in conjunction with the con con cost. consumer price index. Uh, when I believe, it, as I read the report, it is tied to the consumer price. Yeah, is right. it not? So it will be raising. Okay. But, but if there's, for some reason, there is a need to change the fee beyond the, the uh, con consumer price index, it can be done by resolution, separate resolution. Okay, thank you for your patience. I have one last question. Uh, this is with regard to VMTs and uh, we saw with this pandemic, a lot of people that wanted to work from home, some of which were unable, unable to do so due to lack of access to technology. So um, if a part, if either businesses or the city decided to lay down fiber optics, um, so that we would reduce the vehicle miles traveled so that more of our residents and businesses could stay home and work from home uh, and not have to commute to their jobs. Um, is this something that would cover that cost, either of the fiber optics or of, you know, uh, whatever would need to be done to cover the infrastructure costs for, insta for installing the fiber optics? 
the uh, the city has an agreement with uh, Sci-Fi Networks to run fiber to every residential, actually every property in Simi Valley. Uh, we are they we anticipate them starting construction of that project probably late this year. So and they have a three-year time frame. So potentially within the next three to four years, every property in Simi Valley will have fiber to the door. Uh, so we're mm -hmm. all, we've been we've been working on that, and that's gonna. That's going to take the city a long way. Um, we will, at that point in time, be a gigabit city with uh, every residential property and commercial property having fiber uh, to the property. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, any other questions of staff? All right, is there anyone in the city council chambers or on Zoom wishing to be heard on this matter? Are you are you aware of any city council? Mr. Mayor, we have no speakers for this item. Okay. We'll give them just a second to make sure. Okay. The hearing portion is closed. Any uh, comments or questions from members of the city council? I think we just did that. So. Mr. Mayor, may I make a motion? You may. I move to adopt the Simi Valley Traffic Impact Nexus Fee Study Update, adopt resolution number 2021-01, and repeal resolution number 2016-04. A second. Uh, second. And there's a resolution to be read? You read it? Okay. Second? I second. Okay. Second it. Okay, we have a uh, motion and a second. Call for the vote. Please vote yes for me. Please vote yes for me as well. The motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, next on the agenda is item 4B, and this item was continued to a date uncertain by a vote of four to one. Okay, we'll move to the next item. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is item five, public statements. <laughs> this is the time for public statements on all items other than public hearings, appointments, and informational reports. All comments submitted by email have already been provided to the City Council and will be made part of the record. However, they will not be read by the City Clerk at this, this evening. All persons should register by 3.30 p.m. today will be called on to speak during this public statements item five for a period of no more than three minutes each. Persons addressing the city council are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Mr. Mayor, unless you have any other comments, we can begin the Zoom public statements. Oh, ready for the first speaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The first speaker tonight is Ms. Aaliyah Ewing. Ms. Ewing? Hi, uh, yes. Um, thank you. How much time do I have? Three minutes minutes perfect um so i'm here to speak to you today about um both the sce power shutoffs and agenda item a the power shutoffs are harmful to everyone and i understand that you don't have um, any authority over socal edison but you do have a responsibility to the people of simi valley for months people have been losing power for extended periods of time including over 36 hours i don't have to tell you how this has negatively impacted our residents because you already know what I would like to know is what our government is doing to protect senior residents without heat. Senior's weather has dropped down into the 50s and without power, senior residents are forced to sit in the cold, which can be very painful. The city opened up cooling centers for seniors last summer when the heat was in the hundreds. Is there any plan in place to protect senior residents from the cold? I'm also speaking to you today to ask that you change the default tier to 100% renewable energy instead of the current disgraceful 36%. Climate change affects everyone and is part of the reason that our weather has been so drastic. Senior residents only need weather protective centers because our city, among others, haven't done their duty to protect us from climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Brown. Ms. Brown, please unmute yourself. Oh, hello. Um, hold on just a second. 
Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and the rest of the city council. I am Asher Brown. I was born and raised in Simi Valley. I love this town. And I tell everyone how great this town is um, every time I meet them. Um, however, I'm really concerned uh, about um, I'm really concerned about the idea of changing to 100% renewable energy. Um, I was one of those people that did not know that I had to opt out of the program um, before automatically being enrolled into the clean energy. Uh, with the new clean energy um, program, my bill went up by double the normal amount I pay. It took them three, uh, three months to, to get me out of the program. Uh, therefore, uh, those three months I had to pay double. I really do not want someone else to go through this, especially during this pandemic, which people all over are going through this economic hardship. This idea is absurd and unnecessary. Uh, like I said, I would not like anyone's bill to go up during this time of hardship that everyone's going through. Therefore, I think we need to focus less on this subject and more on how we are going to get businesses back on track for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rebecca Alboron. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Rebecca and I am following up regarding the Safe Park Pilot Program that has already been approved by the city. As I understand, the hope was to initiate the program sometime in December. It is now January 25th. I'm asking each council member to request an update for this program. When will it start? I'm also requesting to know the dollar amount of the community development block grant, block grant funds. I would like us to use the funds to secure housing for all the unhoused population in this city for at least the next year. These funds are meant to assist the city to ensure decent, affordable housing and provide services to the most vulnerable in our community. I'm also requesting that we move um, the Clean Power Alliance from tier, from the lowest tier to the top tier, which is the 100% um, renewable energy. And I am also, um, I would also like to give the community a reminder that on Wednesday, there will be a seminar um, hosted by a nonprofit, Buen Vecino, um, highlighting the rights of people who have, um, who may not have a documented status and also the rights of all um, US citizens. And it's very important, especially in this city that we continue to educate um, the public and that council, and I'm, I'm asking, I'll be sending the, the Zoom invite to all the council members, invite them to educate themselves on things that they've previously have have not um, supported um, and it's important for all of us to know our rights, even the community that do not have um, a legal status in um, the US. Thank you. Thank you. April Amante. Hello. Yes, we hear you. Oh, hi, thank you. Um, hi, my name is April Amanti. I'm a lifelong resident of Simi Valley. And um, I'm calling in to say that I support resetting the default energy tier to 100% renewable energy for Simi Valley Clean Power Alliance. Uh, it's really important to me that every city, um, especially my own <laughs> Simi Valley, become a green city, providing uh, union paying jobs and reducing the effects of these power shutoffs as the others have eloquently before me stated all of those negative effects that they have as because of also the effect of these wildfires and extreme weather that are part of the sad, unfortunate reality of climate change that too many of us are in denial of. And it's critical that we leave a cleaner world for our children and grandchildren that we have now. That's very critical to me as a citizen. Um, this will pro also provide money to train experienced former oil and coal workers in renewable energy and help them get union paying jobs in the renewable energy field. I, I truly believe this is the only way forward. There's no going back. We can only go forward to this new way. So um, thank you very much for listening. And I also would like to echo um, what Rebecca said about following up on the Safe Parks program. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Cassandra Douglas? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. I'm calling to support. Um, I'm calling in support of agenda item 8A to increase the top tier to 100% for renewable energy. The city needs to make the necessary steps to become greener and make renewable energy a priority. This will benefit our residents, our businesses, and the future of our city. Also, with the events that have folded at the Capitol on January 6th, I'm also asking the city adopt a resolution to ban concealed weapons at city council meetings and on city property. I'm going to echo both Rebecca and April and ask for an update on the Safe Park program. We're now almost two, min two months into the proposed pilot program dates. We have not been provided an update. And again, like Rebecca said, we'd like to know the amount of the community development block grant funds available and request that those be used to secure housing for the unhoused members of our community. And as council members, I do hope all of you do participate and join the webinar that is happening tomorrow hosted by Rise Ambient Encino in regards to navigating your rights um, when it comes to ICE and law enforcement. That's all I have, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Roop Mon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, hello, members of the council and Mayor Mashburn. Um, in regards to agenda item 8A, I wanna say that I support resetting the default energy tier to 100% renewable energy. This will have many benefits to businesses, provide unit, union paying jobs and reduce PSPS events. It's also extremely important for me, someone who was born and raised in Simi Valley, um, for us to reduce our carbon footprint so that my kids um, and my kids' kids can live in a beautiful Simi Valley, just like I had the opportunity to do. Um, you can also opt out of this program, which makes it a win-win for everybody. Um, and I do hear concerns, so maybe making sure that the opt-out option is, is more clear or more available to everybody may help um, for those people who may not want to opt into that. Um, I also would like an update on the safe park program since that was set to expire in March, but hasn't started. I feel like it should be extended. Um, so I would love an um, update on that. Um, and echoing what Rebecca, Cassandra and April said, I wanna know the dollar amount that we have of the community development um, block grant um, funds. I'm requesting that we use those funds to secure housing for the unhoused population in the city, especially in the middle of a pandemic um, that, you know, we see no clear end to at the moment. It's extremely important to take care of our unhoused neighbors in Simi Valley. Thank you so much. Thank you. John Kaposia. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and members of the city council. I'm John Capocha, former mayor of Sierra Madre, and I'm encouraging you to change your electricity default to 100% green renewable power. Sierra Madre joined the Clean Power Alliance with a clean power default of 50% green, but has since converted to 100%. What I didn't understand when Sierra Madre first joined was that inertia inhibits the lack of movement for customers to opt up to green or down to lean. The data shows remarkable consistency with all the CPA members' customers. Very few will opt up, down, or out, regardless of where you start. I was expecting many to opt up to 100% green, but when it didn't happen, I asked constituents about their personal choices. It was surprising to me that many supporters of aggressive action to address climate change would never get around to making the change to opt up to 100% renewable. After discussion, they typically expressed embarrassment over their lack of action. This convinced me that I made a mistake by not initially supporting a default of 100% green. Personally, I'm alarmed by the evidence that climate change is largely a result of the burning of fossil fuels. So as a community leader, I was compelled to act on the unique opportunity to prevent thousands of tons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere by proposing a change to Sierra Madre's default. I explained it to my constituents this way. I believe climate change is a serious threat to our well being. If you believe that also, the small increase in rates is a small price to pay to be part of the solution. 
If you don't believe climate change is a threat or you can't afford the small increase, then all I'm asking you to do is to take five minutes, pick up the phone and opt down or out. I got very little pushback. When you think about it, it's really hard to argue that having to make a five minute phone call is a terrible injustice or inconvenience. In February, Sierra Madre voted to convert to 100% green and not surprisingly, the opt down rate has been minimal even after a thorough campaign to ensure that our residents understood their options. And I received zero complaints. So members of the city council, I'm telling you from experience that this is easy to do and your action will be profoundly significant. There is nothing else that any of you can possibly do as individuals compared to this to remove thousands of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. If Simi Valley makes the change you're asking, adding to the growing momentum of cities, opting for 100% green, and your actions will encourage others. Your constituents will understand and will be supportive. I urge you to make a difference by exercising leadership with this unique opportunity to help the planet and humanity. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Mr. Robert Perry. Mr. Perry, please unmute yourself. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Good evening, members of the council. My name is Robert Perry. I'm a resident of Simi Valley, and I'm here this evening to provide my public statement for agenda item 8A and urge the city council to adopt 100% renewable energy as a default rate option with Clean Power Alliance. With the, with the increasing frequency of power outages, energy resilience is a top priority for California. Since power outages primarily involve disruptions to the transmission lines, the only true resilient energy is both generated and consumed locally. Last week's power outage affecting 28,800 Ventura County residents should bring home the fact that future outages will become more regular and can only be avoided through developing local energy resources not reliant upon vulnerable transmission lines. As the community choice entity responsible for energy procurement, the Clean Power Alliance provides more accountability to local governments and can reduce development costs through aggregation of local energy projects. Revenues received by CPA towards renewable energy resources can be allocated to local clean energy projects through its local programs for a clean energy future strategic plan, which calls for 200 million in local investment and provides assistance for program implementation and delivery. The highest priority objective of the plan is clean backup power for essential facilities such as fire stations, schools, and community centers. By choosing 100% renewable, Simi Valley will have the moral standing to actively participate in this plan to launch local pilot projects. Electing 100% renewable also aligns with California's energy goals. SB 99, the Community Energy Resilience Act of 2021, is on the legislative agenda to assist with local energy planning. If passed, SB 99 will empower communities to plan their energy future by citing local energy resources at critical facilities. Developing local energy resources also mutually reinforces clean transportation infrastructure that reduces unhealthy emissions close to homes and businesses. Simi Valley is not the first CPA agency to revisit its energy tier default and cities that have elected 100% renewable have experienced relatively low opt-out rates. For those opposed to the default tier, the opt-out process is easy and residents will have nine months to complete the process. For the staff report, the new default tier will become effective October 1st, 2021, during which CPA will work with city staff to develop and disseminate two customer notices and an implementation plan that addresses timing and customer communication to ensure a smooth transition. Opting down or out of the default tier make, takes mere minutes using the Clean Power Alliance website, allowing customers to complete the opt-out process in less time than it would take to formally file a complaint. Excuse me, sir, you'll Furthermore, have to wrap up. You'll have to complete your... Okay, if I could just 
uh, yeah, finish you, you need to my final up. statement. You could say thank you. Okay. Thank you for your consideration of this important issue. Thank you. Joe Pachowski. Mr. Pachowski. We'll come back to him. Okay, Mr. Pachowski, we see you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn and members of the city council. We, it's been a rough year for residents of Simi Valley, residents of California, residents of Ventura County, and everybody across the country. I can't believe that our city council would even consider passing along what's effectively a rate increase at a time of a pandemic. The problem here is that people don't know enough to opt out. I can't tell you how many residents I spoke with when the CPA was first introduced and people didn't know how to opt out. Turning around and, and opting for a higher tier is nothing but a de facto rate increase for anybody that, that may not, that may be a low attention uh, participant. We already heard tonight from a woman who, who spoke and said that she got opted in, she opted into the, to the highest rate and it took two months of paying that highest rate, which was double her previous rate to get out. And I think that that alone says, says volumes. The other thing that we need to consider here is, unlike what Mr. Perry had to say, this isn't going to affect anything to do with Southern California Edison. Southern California Edison still delivering the power, whether you're opting for Clean Power Alliance or power from Edison itself. And so, so if Edison shuts it down, even if you're a CPA customer, you're still not getting your electricity. So the CPA has nothing to do with the recent blackouts that we've that we've all experienced in, in our city. And you know, I know that you know the whole city, pretty much the whole city was was without power for at least a good 24 hours last week. This isn't an issue we should be discussing now. The issue we should be discussing now is holding Edison's feet to the fire and exploring other options for for keeping our our lights on every day. Um, and, and that's the bottom line here. Uh, so I want to urge you all to vote no on this rate increase. By, opt, by by keeping it at the at the at the current tier of 36 percent and and leaving it at leaving it at that thank you very much have a good evening thank you Aubrey Lancaster Miss Lancaster please unmute yourself Looks like we're having difficulty hearing you. Hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me now? There we go. Ah, so sorry about that weird microphone thing. Uh, my name is Aubrey Lancaster. I'm in District 1, lifelong Simi Valley resident, and I just wanted to come live because I thought it's very important to support item 8, 8A, uh, resetting the default energy tier to 100%. I absolutely hear Ashley's concern, and honestly, that is a failure of communication, not of policy. I think this is a fantastic policy. The mayor from Sierra Madre uh, gave excellent testimony as to its viability and I really hope we can move forward on this and perhaps really work hard to make sure that there is better communication so we don't have problems like Ashley had. Uh, I also want to back up what Rebecca said. I really want to know what we're doing to help our homeless right now. It's freezing out there and these are not good 
circumstances for us to have people out on our streets, and these are our citizens and our neighbors. Uh, I also am concerned about what Cassandra said about uh, having guns on city property, especially after what happened at the Capitol and some of the threats that have been made against Councilmember Levinos. So um, that was my main thing. I really think we're an amazing city and we have a lot that we can offer and putting ourselves forward on this renewable energy is important. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Reese Holland. Mr. Holland, please unmute yourself. Hi there. Yes, we hear you. Fantastic. Good evening, Mayor Mashburn, City Council, and Simi Valley residents. My name is Reese Holland. I am a lifelong resident of the neighborhood District 2 area. I support resetting the default energy tier to 100% for the Clean Power Alliance for the residents, uh, residential and uh, commercial customers. Uh, Simi Valley really needs to take this opportunity to move to being a green city. Resetting the energy tier to 100% should be the first step in utilizing the vast solar and wind capabilities that Simi can access by setting up solar and wind generators on homes, schools, businesses, and city and government buildings. In addition, a move to wind and solar throughout the city will be able to be tied to infrastructure upgrades that will hopefully make Simi Valley more resistant to public safety power shutoff events as the power will now be localized and it won't be coming from Edison uh, with a goal of full 24 seven, 365 operation and energy independence. Now I know that's not initially what 8A is going to go to do, but it will help pave the way towards doing that. And it will make it a lot easier for us to go that direction when energy independence is already a feature, any function that we are actively working towards. Uh, this would in, uh, reinforce what Mr. Perry stated about increasing accountability and localizing power to reduce the vulnerability of public safety power shutoffs, which greatly affect and impact the city and in a variety of different ways that uh, are just not accounted for and um, uh, nobody's being held accountable for them, unfortunately. I understand that Miss um, Brown, who spoke earlier, had a pricing issue, and um, I agree that moving to a full citywide renewable uh, energy rate, uh, we we definitely need to improve the uh, the messaging on it. Like um, uh, Mr. Pachowski was saying, we you know we need to make sure people know that this is being done, that it's a thing that they can opt out of, that it's going to affect their bills. Uh, whether it's something that's explicitly put on their bills or we contact each and every citizen by email, by phone, by mail, multiple times to make absolutely sure, give them an ample window to opt out. Opt out. Um, you know, we, we can alleviate the worries of people that are potentially going to get uh, locked into something that's going to be more expensive than they, they're able to afford. In a city with three times the uh, national average median income, I think we can kind of afford it, though. Uh, I also want to echo what Rebecca, April, Cassandra, and Roop said about uh, getting an update on the Safe Park pilot program. I was very strong in activating for that, uh, activating for that, <clears throat> um, uh, advocating for that, excuse me. And uh, I'd really like to see what's going on with that. If the only thing that's holding it up now is sure, getting Mr. approval Holland, from citizens of Marta so, Court, Mr. we can Holland. work that out. If it's getting Mr. a little Holland, built up, I remember, up. Um, was it uh, Mayor Mashburn or Mr. Council Holland, member? Your time is up. Hmm? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, that concludes the public statements. Thank you. At this time, we'll uh, take any comments from uh, council members. I'll just go around so we don't have to. Elaine, you can go ahead and go first. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, we will be discussing um, the rate increase, et cetera, uh, um, item A, so I'm not going to make any comments about that at this time, but I appreciate the comments that were made. Thank you for all participating. I did actually, though, want to follow up on uh, com one comment that Aliyah Ewing um, asked about um, we have had um, cooling stations when there have been problems 
obviously with PSPS is occurring, one of her questions is, do we offer the same heating stations or do we have a, a possibility? Now, I recognize I don't think there's been a need. Well, I'm not sure that there's been a need, but obviously if there are other PSPS events in this cold weather, et cetera, do we have some kind of a, a, a would the senior center also be a, a potential place for that type of activity would, would be a question I might have. Uh, yes, it is. We certainly could do that. The problem we ran into with this last PSPS, PSPS event was the senior center was located in a circuit that was scheduled to go down. Um, so it would not have provided the, um, the shelter that uh, we would hope for. Um, we've, we've been working uh, cooperatively with school and park district about some of the other locations, but they've all been, unfortunately, they've all been affected by the same power outage. So we're uh, it's, it's becoming, uh, for a large event like this, challenging to find a location that still has power. Um, but we continue to always look for those opportunities to provide for a warming station as well as a cooling station. Um, uh, we'll be bringing some options back to the council probably next month for um, get, uh, getting funding for generators for some of our facilities that may be able to take care of that issue. And hopefully we would be in a position to have that in place before uh, the next round of PSPS events that would be happening in 2021, hopefully many, many months away. Thank you. And, and just one final thing in response to those who are asking about the safe park. It is my understanding that we have uh, security there in place. Everything has been in place. Um, it, it, residents are what are, 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 who would qualify or what could use it right now if it were. Yeah. Safe, it Safe Park opened uh, in December, actually, I think on December 22nd. We have had no takers to Safe Park. Our police uh, officers, the homeless liaisons, as well as the uh, executive director of the Samaritan Center have been doing extensive outreach to uh, homeless individuals that are living in their cars. Uh, several just, um, my understanding is several didn't uh, felt they were um, find where they were, uh, wherever they are currently parking. Uh, there have been several that didn't want to abide by the rules that uh, would be in place. Um, and, and so there are uh, sort of some takers uh, d just didn't, didn't uh, want to take part in it. But it is open, it is available, and anyone that may be listening want to take advantage of it or anyone wants to refer people to it, please refer them to the Samaritan Center uh, to get them signed up for the program. But it is, it is open, it is available. Thank you. Council Member Luevanos. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will save my comments on the uh, CPA default rate for when we get to that on the agenda for A day. Uh, I would like to say that I believe anyways, one of the reasons why we have had no takers for the Safe Park program is because it is so restrictive. Um, and at the very least, uh, we can offer our homeless community hand warmers that doesn't does not require any any electricity and we could justify using uh, PSPS funds or some of our general funds to at least hand out hand warmers uh, which is what I use when I go camping it's going to be 36 degrees tonight and that is insanely cold um, so if we can do something like that I will I'm going to ask for that thank you for bringing up the Buen Vecino uh, program to help uh, people know about the rates, whether they're undocumented or U.S. citizens, very important. I, I will try my best to attend. And, and as far as the um, banning guns on campus, because I am concerned about security uh, of all of our uh, city staff, I will be bringing that up as a 9B request. Thank you for everyone who participated. Hey, council member, judge, do you have any comments? Sorry, Mr. Mayor, trying to unmute my thing. That's fine. We hear you now. Yeah, I don't have any specific comments. I will direct my comments for the uh, uh, CPA fees at, uh, at that time. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Kavanaugh. The same as the other council members, I'll hold comments on the CPA till we get to that item. And I did just want to um, thank the city manager for explaining where we are on Safe Park. He informed us, the city council, of that about a month ago, I think. So we were all aware that we had no takers to this point in time. So please feel free to reach out to a city council member and ask if you have a concern. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
my only comments are, are basically the same, that the safe park is in operation. However, there's been no takers, as previously stated. I did drive through it twice just to verify that it was staffed, and it looks from the exterior to be a quality uh, restroom facility. It is close to the homes of other uh, residents in the valley, so therefore there does need to be restrictions or rules, whatever you want to call it, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sorry? And security is there. Yeah, and security is there, and um, it, it's there, and we hope uh, people will go to the Samaritan Center, sign up, and use it as needed, because it, it is a, a, a good operation, we believe. And, uh, and the only way we're going to verify that is if you go and try it out and use it. And uh, my comments, the electrical will be at that time. So we'll go to the next item. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next item on the agenda is item six, the consent calendar. And there is one resolution for consideration this evening. Consent item number nine, resolution number WWD-281, a resolution of the Board of Directors of Ventura County Waterworks District Number 8, accepting an easement agreement and easement grant deed for access and maintenance purposes to an existing water main line at 9420 Trails End Drive, APN number 649-0-152-030. Do we have any questions on consent? May I have a question? Uh, I'd like to call consent item number four. Number four? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, why don't we address the questions on number four and uh, see if we can throw them in all together. Okay, yes. Um, I'm waiting for staff. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. We'll wait for staff. Yeah. There you the, I don't know if you can see it, but the chief is here at the podium. Okay, yes, I was waiting for him to get the mic set up and get it to his, the right can, height and everything. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Uh, yes, my question is, what, what is the majority of this grant going to be spent on? Is it going to be spent on equipment or software or training or what? what is most of it going to be? Spent on. I see that it says materials for communication center door, uh, public relations, MacBook Pros, and upgrade to communication. So most of this is for communication? Yes, it's it's most of it uh, for our dispatch center. It, for, you can see from the staff report, uh, adding a door and uh, also for public relations and outreach uh, for the MacBook uh, Pro computer purchase. Yes. I was just curious, is that why do we need a new door? Um, well, it outlines in the staff report uh, the um, uh, we only have one door currently that accesses it. It goes through the watch commander's office. So in an emergency, uh, a dispatcher might not be able to get back into the room uh, quickly, especially because we're low staff there right now. We need to have uh, you know, a supervisor uh, that can observe what's going on in there. The other thing is, is that um, right now, the way the office is set up, um, the supervisor uh, has to discuss employee evaluations in a common room where uh, there's, um, you know, with to still be available to watch what's going on in the room because we're so low staffed. Uh, and so having this extra door and access to the office space will allow um, the dispatch supervisor to discuss uh, you know, uh, private employee information and still be able to observe through a glass window what's going on in case there's an emergency. Okay, and is there, I was just curious, because uh, I know there's other funding sources, is this, um, are there other funding for sources to buy the like the MacBooks and things like that, or this is just what you guys allotted to spend this money on? Uh, no, this is what we allotted to spend the money on. Uh, we chose to um, you know get items that were going to make the workplace uh, more efficient and uh, to benefit other people other than just you know buying uh, standard police equipment with it. We used it to um, get equipment that could be used to enhance the uh, the building and and to our also enhance our public outreach through the public relations bureau. Okay, and then my last question that I'm sorry I didn't ask you ahead of time. Do you know how much is left in our I see that $974 
is come from is coming from the forfeited assets fund 280. Do you know how much money is left in that fund by any chance? Um, and if yeah, not, you can tell me later. Yeah, I do. It's it's in the staff report. Um, it's uh, it's over a million dollars uh, that's in there right now. And I think uh, the staff report refers to even if we uh, went to forfeited assets for all the uh, expenses that we're outlying in here, it would still leave us with um, 805073 or over $805,000. Including all expenditures for this fiscal year. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just want to add that I think it's quite admirable that we are paying for this with a grant. So funds that are we're receiving without any um, cost to us. I, anyway, I, I appreciate you applying for and and getting these to be utilized in such a positive way. Yeah, the this, this staff always likes to try to get the grants when we can get them, and the JAG grant is one that we are pretty successful at getting every year. So Excellent. Okay, are there any other council members that would like to speak? I'd just like to make a, a comment. After reading the staff report, I just wanted to compliment the chief and the department on the good use. You took a small amount of money and spread it out and are covering a lot of needs. So I just wanted to compliment you. Good job. Okay, at this time we're looking for a motion for the nine items. Move to, for, Mayor, right? I move to approve consent items one through nine. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Call for the vote. Vote yes for me, please. And for me also. Thank you. The motion, the motion passes unanimously. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, there are no items this evening under item 7, continued business. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 8A. Consideration to reset the default energy tier to 100% 100, 100 renewable energy for Simi Valley Clean Power Alliance residential and business customers. And Samantha Argabright is here for this presentation. She's on her way, so give, just give her one second. We cut her snoozing. Whoops. And here she is. Evening. I could only hear in my office, so I wanted to make sure that I knew when it was time for me to come down, and then it took me a little while. Good evening, Mayor Ashburn and members of the City Council. Clean Power Alliance has been the default electricity provider in Simi Valley since 2019. The default selected by the city provides 36% renewable energy content at a 1 to 2% cost savings. Closer. Okay. Relative to the SCE base rate. Better? During the December 14, 2020 City Council meeting, Councilmember Loevenos requested that the City Council discuss resetting the city's default tier from 36% or lean power to 100% or the green power tier. Resetting to 100% clean energy would mean an approximate increase of 8 to 9% on average of customers' current bills or in the $10 range for a residential customer and approximately $18 for a commercial customer depending on their base bill. Should the City Council vote to change the City's default tier, CPA staff must be notified prior to the January 31st deadline. The new default tier will be effective October 1st, 2021. As part of the transition to a new tier, CPA will notify residential and commercial customers of the change and the customer's options to opt down or out of CPA with two customer notices. It is important to note that customers who have already elected to opt out or opt up during the first transition from SCE to CPA will not need to change their rate option or opt out again as their original election will remain in place. Should the city vote to change the default tier to 100%, customers will still have the ability to opt down or opt out. Customers who are income qualified and enrolled in the CARE program 
will receive 100% renewable energy at the 36% rate tier. The Supplemental Customer Status Report distributed today and dated January 19th indicates that in Simi Valley, 12 of 5,557 non-residential accounts have voluntarily opted up to 100% clean power and 82 of 42,468 residential accounts have done so. Nearly 11% of residential accounts and approximately 8% of non-residential accounts have opted out of CPA. In 2020, the cities of Malibu, Sierra Madre, and Camarillo have elected to opt up to a default rate of 100% renewable energy. A list of all CPA member agencies with their default tiers is attached as Exhibit 2 to the staff report. Ted Bardicke, the Executive Director of the Clean Power Alliance, and I are both available for questions. Okay, uh, questions of staff. No questions? Yes, Mayor, I have a question. Who, who was that you, uh, Ruth? Okay. Councilmember Council Levinos, Levinos you're up. You, Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, was, I think I interrupted you, so you are on. Uh, yes, I, with regard to, this is for either um, either Ms. Argerbright or Mr. Uh, Radacki. What is, um, if you are low income, how is this going to impact your bill to go to 100% renewable? So as I previously indicated, um, in the staff report, we discussed that if you are currently in the CARE program, which is the low income um, qualified program, um, you will receive the 100% um, clean power at, um, or green power, I apologize, at that 36% rate tier. So there would be no increase to your bill. So there's for low income residents, there's no increase to the bill. That's correct. Okay, great. Um, and what kind of, um, is, is there a, com I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but do you know whether or not the median income in Camarillo is higher or lower than Simi Valley's? Um, I do not have that information handy. I don't know if Mr. Bardicke does. Uh, sorry, I, I don't, I don't uh, know the income level comparisons. I do want to clarify that Camarillo voted to opt to the clean power rate, not the 100% green. It was uh, Sierra Madre and Malibu went to 100 along with Agora Hills and Manhattan Beach. Mm -hmm. um, and Camarillo voted to uh, move to the middle tier. Okay, and um, is this, um, what kind of things does CPA do to um, help the community? Um, do they offer any grants or scholarships? Um, how about supporting people who wanna go into renewable jobs? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, so we have two programs. We have, uh, one is a community college scholarship program. Um, we work with our developers who, um, who build our renewable energy projects to uh, fund that. Uh, so we've provided, uh, uh, you know, over $100,000 in uh, scholarships to uh, community college students who are pursuing STEM careers. Uh, and then this year we are launching a $1 million workforce development program uh, focused on electrification. Um, and, and thank you, uh, uh, in, in this case, Director Levinos for all of your comments and thoughts on, on that at the last board meeting. Wonderful. Um, and and um, people will have how long to opt out if they choose to opt out, how long would they have to opt out? Well, so um, any customer can opt out uh, at any time or change their rate at any time. Uh, so they could do that today or if you ch chose to change your default or, or didn't in next October. Um, we do, for all of the cities that change defaults, we do do a additional public education campaign, two notices. Um, and we, com compared to what we did during the initial enrollment, it's a lot more customized by the city because this was a this would be a specific um, decision made by the city to change uh, the service level. And um, we wanna make sure that we would co-brand that with the city with any kind of messaging. Um, so, you know, Malibu was a little different than Sierra Madre, will be different than Manhattan Beach, will be different than Agora Hills. 
Um, but th that's the additional outreach if uh, default is changed. Okay, and one of the concerns that was brought up by one of the speakers was, uh, you know, changing our default rate in the middle of a pandemic. What kind of financial assistance has CPA offered uh, people that have been impacted financially due to the pandemic? So uh, we have, um, uh, we launched a, uh, in, in May, we launched a uh, COVID-19 bill credit program, uh, two, two million dollars. Um, we're almost up at that, uh, at that level now. Um, but in Simi Valley, we've uh, um, issued credits to over 2,600 of your customers totaling uh, over $65,000 um, in bill credits. And those are bill credits that are essentially incentives and bonuses for folks to, who are newly unemployed, who've had their hours cut, their wages cut uh, due to COVID, um, small business customers who are on payment plans to get further assistance. So those are folks who have now newly signed up for CARE or FARO or, or one of the other um, income uh, programs. We'll be working in, uh, in 2021. Uh, there's still a number of customers, uh, whether they're low income or not, who uh, are behind on their bills. Um, and we uh, are working uh, in, connect in collaboration with Edison and the state to um, help delinquent customers work off those, those bills and actually do bill forgiveness uh, for delinquencies if they maintain payments uh, consecutive for, for 12 more months now. So CPA is offering bill forgiveness, bill credits and payment plans? That's correct. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Council Member Litzner. Thank you. Um, Ted, appreciate you're your here to offer information. Would you repeat that number again that you gave? You said that how many residents were had struggled to, to that you needed to issue credits to? Did you say 2,600 customers in Simi Valley? Is that what you said? That's correct. So 2,600. I can give you the exact number. Uh, as of last week, it was 2,663 customers. Um, and we're, we're giving... Uh, uh, bill credits of uh, $25 or $50, depending on people's circumstances. Um, and uh, what that, that payment does is um, it links someone into uh, being a newly enrolled care customer or newly enrolled on a payment plan. And so, to, I'm, and I'm sorry, so I, I just want to know what percentage of our, of our customers, of Simi Valley customers, that represents. 2,600, 2,663 customers is what percentage of the total number of customers that you have uh, had to give Let me look. Let to? me look. Give me just one second. Um, so you have uh, 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 just over 43,000 customers in Simi Valley. So if we did the math. So about 5% if we're talking residential. Yeah, something like that. In that neighborhood, yeah. Okay. That's um, uh, that's only. I'll just say that's only the new customers who've signed up through this program. I'd have to look uh, deeper into the total number of customers in your service territory who are on uh, care or fara. Gotcha. So that's but just I, the I, new cut. So about five percent newly have had struggled. There are others that are already receiving some type of a discount based on that, income. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank. Thank you very much. Um, in the past, when, when the city made this decision to move to um, Clean, um, Clean Power Alliance, is it my understanding that, they, that all residents were noticed that they had the option of going, they had the option of opting out, staying with SE? Were they at that time also given the notice that they, were, that they could opt into um, or, or increase to a clean level or green level? Did they also have that option at that time? That is correct. Yes, yes, they did. Okay, and so of the residents then that have, um, that all of the residents, it, am I correct in understanding that it was less than half of 1% that chose to support 100% clean energy? Is that correct? Did I read that correct? 
According to the customer status report that we received, that is correct. So, and I think my calculation was 0.39%, so less, sizably less than half of 1% supported going to clean, 100% clean energy. Uh, according to the stats, and Ted, correct me if I'm wrong, but looking at the data that I have, it looks like um, for residential customers, it was 0.19%, and for non-residential customers, it was 0.22% that opted up to 100%. Thank Sorry. You. Yes, that's that's correct. What we um, find across the the service territory is that generally people go either opt out or stay in, and when they stay in, they stay at the default level that the city chooses. That's just what we we see that uh, across the board. I haven't seen one city, uh, except for the cities that have changed default levels. I haven't seen a city. Uh, where you know more than one or even one and a half percent have uh, changed the level that was otherwise determined by their city. Gotcha. And I'm and I'm just trying to understand our involvement with some of the municipalities in Simi Valley. Um, for instance, is this has the city is the city at the lean level? Have they chosen to stay there? What about our park services? What about our schools? Do we know? What, they, what choices they have made as far as their uh, energy provider level and whether they've stayed with as, with. I do not CPM. know that. Um, I don't know if, if Mr. Bardicky knows that or not, um, but I am not sure if they opted in, if they stayed in or if they opted out. I can find that out though. Um, what about the city right now? Are we um, part of this program? We are. Um, we are at um, the, the lean power tier, so we are at that 36% rate. And then depending upon um, if the city council were to choose to um, to move to the 100% tier, there would be a cost impact to the city's current accounts. And what has the city's ca calculation been as far as the impact of going to the Clean Power Alliance? Because as I understand, initially, we were told, of course, I wasn't there at the time, I don't believe, on council. but. I believe that the council was told that there would be a cost savings. Has that materialized? Um, the city, I would have to run the statistics if we've seen a cost savings on the accounts that we have in CPA. Um, we have approximately 238 accounts currently in CPA. Um, some are still with Edison based on um, our usage and um, based on some of the programs that we're pursuing. So some of those had to stay with Edison. Okay. Um, so I can't give you a, a complete clean across the board. Um, but um, based on if we were to move toward um, uh, the 100 percent tier, I believe um, I'd have to look at my, my statistics, but I believe it was going to be about a $17,000 cost um, for the accounts that we have in CPA for us to move to the 100 percent tier. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I have a question to um, up. Um, recently, the city suffered with a lot of the PSPS. I'm sure you're familiar with that. What has the position of um, CPA been as far as trying to rectify that issue? Yeah, thank you. And I want to say we, we, we feel uh, your pain. We we get a lot of calls to our customer service center when when uh, those PSPS events take place. Um, as as was noted uh, during public comment, um, we do not have control over those. Those are absolutely just uh, Edison's notes. And I know there is a um, uh, upcoming public hearing uh, organized by the by the CPUC that I would encourage the city to attend. Our response has, has uh, been to launch the, our Power Ready program, which is designed to put one clean energy backup power system in each one of our member agencies. So we've been working with your staff to identify whether it's a cooling center or an emergency management center or your city hall or someplace where um, we could, at no charge to the city, um, install a, a clean energy backup power system, basically a solar system and a battery so that you would have uh, at least one more uh, facility within the city 
that would stay on during a PSPS event. Um, so we've really been focused more on the on the mitigation side, given that we don't have any control over uh, what Edison does uh, at, in terms of calling or operationalizing a PSPS event. Okay, so am I accurate in saying that you're a customer of Edison also? Yeah, we it's it's an interesting relationship with Edison. Um, we are we compete with them on the generation side to offer more options at competitive rates, um, and yet we have to partner with them because they're the ones who have the exclusive control of the delivery of energy to all of our mutual customers. Okay, so I would think that you would have a a very big voice if uh, being such a big user. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure you'll be at the CUPC meeting and voicing the concerns that we have. Uh, absolutely, we hear it across, um, you know, Ventura County has been particularly hard hit, Moore Park, uh, Simi Valley, Thousand Oaks, uh, even canceled a, a city council meeting in Oxnard last week because of PSPS. Um, so we hear it um, and we do speak out uh, both in public and private. Okay, and, and just to confirm what I was saying, you'll be at the CUPC meeting tomorrow at two o'clock, your company? Yeah, we'll have a rep. Yes, we will have a rep there. And yes. they'll be speaking in favor of making some changes? Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen the talking points yet, but um, <laughs> we're, we're definitely will let folks know. Okay, the other question I have, since it's, my understanding of it is it's your power that's being transmitted by their distribution system. And so what kind of rebates have you provided to your customers in Simi Valley based on the uh, PSPS events? Rebates or discounts or not charging for those days or paying for their food? I don't know what, but I think you understand what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah so we, um, we obviously can't charge a customer for electricity that was never delivered. So um, our, you know, we're, our metering and billing system works on 15 minute intervals. So, um, you know, if somebody goes off, they're not getting charged. Um, and then uh, Edison, because they're calling the events are the, is really the one who's, um, you know, responsible for any reimbursements and taking care of folks um, in, in, that, in that event. I think you can, I hope you can understand that uh, we, you know, we, we have no control over that. Um, and the more we um, sort of get involved, the more we end up taking blame for something that we don't have any control over. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I do understand that, that you, you've, you're, you're using a provider and they're not providing. And so in a sense, you're a bit of a victim like the end user is also. So I, I, I do understand that. And I, I do agree with you that the responsibility should fall in the lap of the, the person that's supposed to be delivering it to the home. Um, I think that's it for me right now. Okay. Oh, uh, just to clarify, the, w the way I understand it now, if anybody that signed up, they can sign up for any level. That's correct. Any One of the features of Clean Power Alliance is that people can change their rate up or down at any time. So, and that, that's true today. I can go in and change mine and, and just go up. So, okay. And so what the That's city's correct. kind of doing is making that decision for the user, the subscriber. And then- the, 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 Yes, the point of the default um, of, of needing to select a default at any rate is that uh, as we've seen, most people don't make an affirmative choice. Um, we don't, uh, and they're kind of, you know, the the, the choice of a default is a policy choice um, that we give to all of our member agencies. Um, and uh, it's basically there for the vast majority of customers who don't end up making an affirmative choice. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, at this time we'll okay. go to comments. And Can I just ask one question about sure. the, about the sure. raised that you, you mentioned your power ready um, program that you were working, partnering with cities or, um, mm -hmm. to provide this power pack up system. 
is that a function of which rate do we choose? I mean, whether we're lean green or mean or or sorry, <laughs> <laughs> lean yeah, clean um, or green. I'm no, just... no, no, no. That's that's not. I need to clarify that that um, you know our financial you know uh, status is you know we we basically charge cost of service. So um, uh, you know your lean clean or 100% default has no impact on our financials or the level of service that we provide or programs that your customers can access with the exception of uh, the, the subsidy for low-income customers on the 100% green rate. But other than that, um, we, uh, in terms of programs and other things, we treat all of our cities equally. Thank you. I can add to that, uh, council member. Mm -hmm. um, the, the program is definitely something that the city has looked at. Um, however, CPA is typically looking for agencies that have not previously installed um, solar. Mm. And since we have solar at our senior center and um, here at City Hall, um, it, it doesn't appear to be a program that we would be able to, to partner with CPA on at this time. Thank you. And Thank just you. to follow up with that also, we are under an agreement with Tesla for the battery backup systems at our facilities um, through the SGIP program. Um, so we're well on our way to having um, having those installed too. So we're, um, we got ahead of the curve as it were. Gotcha. Great. Okay, uh, this time we'll go around and uh, have comments from the um, council members and we'll start with council member Litzer. Thank you. Um, I, this is an interesting um, discussion for me because I recognize that um, it is important certainly that we make choices that um, encourage um, responsible energy usage and, and, and options that encourage um, clean usage. Certainly there are different ways that power can be generated. Um, and so I, I appreciate that we are, we are working or partnering with Clean Power Alliance. But that being said, I am very mindful that um, we're discussing, as one said, whatever we want to call it, we're discussing a 9% rate increase for all of our residents. Um, and whether we call it a increasing the default rate or whatever, however we want to put it, it truly is a rate increase. And when I hear that... Um, Already 5% of our city needs subsidies just this last year to pay their power bills. And that's in addition to those who have already subscribed to the CARES program, et cetera. It concerns me that we, um, that we might be placing this burden on our residents. Um, I, I'm just very mindful of that. And because of those concerns, um, I just don't think that this is the time to go forward with advocating 100% green uh, at this time. I just think that we need, we have a responsibility to our constituents. I'm aware that uh, many don't read the fine print and, and don't make those choices, but I'm also aware that anyone who truly is concerned absolutely has the option of opting to go 100% um, and encourage those who, uh, those, in fact, those who spoke today and, were con and spoke strongly about that need, I encourage them to go to their power bills and make that personal choice to go to 100% because I think that that's very admirable that they have that passion and I encourage them to do so. I'm just mindful of the letters that we received on both sides, many from people who are very concerned about where their power bills are and, and please um, leave it where, where it's at. And so just, I guess my concern right now is, is what's happening in this difficult time and I do not feel, feel it's time to raise our rates. It's that simple on my, for me. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Luevinos. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I, I remember when they came, when CPA came, and I was not even thinking about running for city council, but I was a concerned resident. I saw that renewable energy was coming to Simi Valley. They talked about switching to a different provider. Um, and I, I remember asking my husband to watch our kids so that I could come to the city council meeting specifically to hear the presentation on Clean Power Alliance and this new energy provider. And I sat there for um, several hours through the city council meeting and through the presentation. 
And I went home and I, and I told my husband, I said, you know, they're going to change energy providers. He said, what do you think? I said, you know, we owe this to our kids. We owe this to our kids. And they promised that their rates are going to be competitive with SoCal Edison. Now we, like many families in the city of Simi Valley, are two wage earner household. That means both of us have to work in order to make ends meet. I work three jobs actually, and my husband uh, is a full-time employee, employee as well. Um, however, the question in my mind remains, if not now, when? And if not us, who? I want you to be mindful that it snowed and hailed in Antelope Valley and Phoenix today. If we do not consider climate change now, we will be swimming later. A report in the New York Times came out that our children will see coastal cities underwater within their lifetime by 2050. Three weeks ago, the city of Long Beach, which is an hour, less than an hour drive away, created a city climate action and adaptation plan so they could figure out what to do once their city starts becoming inundated. We have cities, uh, coastal cities across the nation that are making these plans because of climate, act, climate concerns. The time to act is now. We have in fact lost over two dozen days to PSPS events and the weather will only continue to get extreme because of climate change. Our residents, our workers, our students, our teachers, our businesses, our employees have lost wages, have lost schooling, have lost critical communication during a pandemic because of extreme weather. Being a green city would attract more businesses. It would attract more residents, more employers, more workers to wanna to come to our city, to know that we're a green city, to put us up there with Agoura Hills, to put us up there with the city of Malibu, to say that the city of Simi Valley is as green as the city of Malibu or Agoura Hills. That's a feather in our cap. That's how we make policy that improves the economic outcome for our residents, for our businesses, that attracts people to come here. I will tell you that the Simi Valley Unified School District has already taken the lead. They have installed solar panels in a number of our public schools and all residents responded positively. I have not heard one person say, oh, I hate those solar panels at our local schools. Quite the contrary. We are very forward thinking and I constantly brag on our school district and the fact that they took into account the future of our students that attend our schools by installing solar panels in a number of our school districts, uh, schools here in Simi Valley Unified. And I commend them for doing that. Now it is our time as city council to take that step, to think of our children's future and to do the right thing. Greta Thunberg stated that the eyes of all future generations are upon you. And when she says you, she means us, the policymakers. And she also stated that if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. That's from our children, from the next generation that is asking us to do something about climate change. And now is our opportunity to do so. Now I can tell you that as a working mother, my husband and I, both are very busy. And yes, we could have opted up to the 100% rate all this time, but we haven't because we've just been that busy. I haven't even had time to ask SCE to reimburse me for all the PSPS equipment that I've had to purchase to deal with all the power outages. So if they defaulted for me and for many two wage earning families in the city of Simi Valley, I don't think anyone would complain. And if they did, then they would just simply default. They would have nine months to default back to the 50% rate or the lien rate. But I know that I would appreciate having this as a default here because I know that I would be doing right by my children, by everyone's children, by the next generation following in the footsteps of the leadership of our school district who's already taken into account by installing solar panels, the future of the next generation. And that's why I am going to be voting in favor of this default rate because um, I also know that there will be a huge um, public uh, you know, uh, outreach in English, in Spanish, in multiple languages that CPA does 
for those and a lot of uh, customer support that they offer for those who want to opt down to 50% or 36%. I also know that the financial support will be there for our low income residents. They're not gonna pay a penny more. If they are low income residents, they're gonna pay the same rate as someone who, 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 who can't afford the 100% rate. So for me, this is a policy stand that we need to make as a city council. This is a business plan to attract more businesses. And this is also a regional effort. We have to remember that we are part of the County of Ventura, which includes many coastal cities. And this, the, the choices we make now are gonna impact other cities in Ventura County, like Oxnard, like Ventura, that are coastal cities that will see underwater change if we do not do something as a city council. And therefore I am asking you to listen to Greta Thunberg, to listen uh, to the eyes of future generations that are upon us right now, this evening at this moment. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Council Member Judge. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, when we passed this on the council, it was at a promise of a one to 3% rate deduction, reduction, excuse me, for our rate payers. Uh, that was obviously my incentive to pass the CPA because I did wanna see that those rate payers get a reduction in their fees. Um, this is one of those opportune times for government not to do anything because everybody has their own individual chance right now to opt into the 100% green energy. They, they had that chance when we opted into the power system. Uh, nothing has changed. But this is also the time when government doesn't have to impose another fee hike on people. Like we've done this year, we've, we've raised, I think we've raised water fees, correct me if I'm wrong, this year. There's been a lot of fees raised on people, not to mention the fact we are still in the middle of this pandemic. So those are my comments. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In, in reading through the report, there were some things that were very interesting and um, the questions asked tonight were very good. I got some answers that kind of even swayed me even more to, to the way I'm going to go. Currently, if we are in the 36 percentile and people are seeing an average of 1% savings, if the city decides to go to the highest 100%, it looks like we're gonna see eight to 9% um, increases. As a single mom raising a child, that could be a lot of money. And I, I know they said they have uh, assistance, but when you're in that middle tier where you make just that little bit too much to not qualify, but you don't make enough to, to really do everything, I was there for years. So I, I, I'm concerned about that group. But what really gets me is right now we're all, a lot of us are working from home. So our power has already gone up tremendously, at least mine has. Each household can choose for themselves to increase if they like. But the worst part is, to me, this is, if we were to raise it to 100%, the response we received from the CPA was that the majority of people don't choose to do different because they don't realize it. I'll be honest, they don't really think about it. To me, that's almost deceptive. If we were to raise that to 100%, we would almost be deceiving our community members into thinking that's what they have to pay. I don't know, that, that just really got me when he said it was so minimal that people opt down. I, I just don't think it's our place to make that decision for each and every household in this community and every business in this community. I respect all the people that wrote in saying, let's go 100%, do it, feel free, you have that option. But to force our community to do that and then have to physically opt out, I, I kind of, I agree with council member judge that that's not our place right now. That's not, that's not government's place to tell people what they have to do at this point in time. I think this is a choice. It, it, it's not something government has to. And if it were to be that situation, then to me, the entire community should vote on it. It would have to be a ballot measure saying our community wishes to go to 100%. But for us to make the decision for everybody else, when each individual person can choose, I think that's the best way to go. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
my feelings are, as I had said at previous council meetings, that we're in a critical time in our city's um, history, if you will, with the COVID and all the challenges we've been receiving. And our restaurants in particular, which uh, I would think are some of the largest users of electricity in our community. And um, this isn't a time to put our wishes on them and increase their rates. Um, I, I think some of the speakers that brought up the um, Green City type of affair or uh, what we're up to, the solar systems that we've installed, this city has been very proactive in going solar and reducing our carbon footprint. Um, I think you can see that by the electric car charging stations and all the solar uh, installations throughout sit the city buildings. I, if we, I, we, in other words, we agree that we need to go with these cleaner uh, energy options, and we're doing it. And that doesn't mean that we need to tell our citizenry how they're going to do it. Uh, I'm okay with sending uh, flyers to them, notification to them, explaining it to them, and explain the benefits of going 100%, and then they can do it if they like. It's entirely up to them. But at this time, it's to me, it's uh, overreach by government to dictate that we're gonna go to the 100% and then expect them to decide how to uh, remove themselves from that if they so desire. So I would rather uh, give them notification that this is available to them and uh, we can encourage it even, but it's not for me to get in their pocketbook and take their money at this particular time. And, uh, and actually, um, I don't think uh, raising taxes or raising fees is uh, a good way to go in this particular time with COVID and through what our entire business community has been through, not to mention all the residents, just like uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Kavanaugh said, people are staying home, so their rates are going up because they're using more power. And um, that's my comment, so that's it. Respectfully, Mayor, may I add another comment? Go ahead. Uh, did you hear me? I... Yes, yes, thank you, Mayor. I'm used yeah, to this I, button. I, yeah. I just want to say I am, you know, appalled at the misrepresentation by my colleagues on the dais. This is not a rate hike. This is a default tier. And it is our responsibility as elected officials to listen to the nine residents who made their voices heard, who took the time to sign up, to make comments. We had nine residents that were in favor of this and two that were concerned about the cost and those issues were addressed. So please do not sit here and say that you care about the public and their input when they take the time to engage in the process of coming to make their voices heard and then those voices are simply ignored. I would just like to make that acknowledgement. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And I, and I would like to say, Councilmember Luevanos, that, that that is actually a bit insulting to us, suggesting that we are not listening to their voices. We appreciate their comments and they are welcome, as we suggested, to go to that, to, to go to the hundred percent. There were also, which is not mentioned, we received in our in our emails uh, numerous others who were on both sides of the issue. Um, I and it doesn't matter to go through all the names, but they weren't here tonight speaking, but they sent emails of concern. And so I think that we are, it is our, responsible, our, it is our responsibility to listen to both sides and to, to all people, all of our constituents who have concerns, and then to go with what we think truly represents their best interest. And so I think it's just that simple. But this is not a rate hike. This is a default rate. We are not raising rates. That is a misrepresentation to say that we are raising rates. Rates would automatically go 9% higher for everyone who was not aware. And that's all we simply are stating. Okay. So. Okay. Um, I'd just like to, to say for the, the, I'm sorry. May I make a motion, Mayor? Hold on one second. I was gonna uh, respond to your comment. Uh, 
I am by no means appalled at your position on, on this subject. Uh, I respectfully listen to it. I'm not appalled to it. We simply have a difference of opinion of where we should go from this point. Mayor, may I make a motion? Yes, you may. I move to select the new default energy chair of 100% renewable energy for clean power lines customers, which is estimated uh, to be an increase of seven to nine percent from SCE's base rate for those who choose not to choose a lower tier. Okay, motion and do we have a second? The motion fails due to lack of a second. And um, may or may, may or may I make another motion? Uh, I, I, one one second. Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Kavanaugh had spoke up first. I, I was going to make a motion to maintain the current default energy tier of thirty six percent renewable energy for Clean Power Alliance customers, which saves customers approximately one percent under SCE's base rate. And I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I will call for the vote. Vote no for me, please. Please vote yes for me. The motion passes with Council Member Levinas voting no. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, next on the agenda is item 9A, City Council member reports. All right, we'll start with Council Member Lou Evanos. Uh, Mayor, on uh, January 13th, um, attended the elected officials meeting on the pandemic and vaccines, um, as I'm sure all my colleagues um, on the dais and at home uh, did as well. On January 14th was the Ventura Council of Governments meeting. Uh, there is an update I wanted to give with regard to uh, the funding for, for um, SCAG funding. Uh, and they are working on a blueprint um, to make available uh, pre-packaged plans for, the, for ADUs and junior ADUs. I'm very excited about this because I know we have a lot of residents who want to uh, make ADUs and junior ADUs, but um, they, they neither have the, the funding or the time to go and you know, get blueprints made and all this. So they're kind of looking at having like a prepackaged set of blueprints. So if people want to do ADUs and junior ADUs and uh, garage conversions, uh, we'll have access to those and they'll kind of be like you know, generic so that when they come to the cities, they'll be approved quickly within the timeline uh, allotted with regard to the new ordinance that we passed and with regard to the state law. So I'm really excited about this uh, proposition of having uh, housing available quickly. Um, especially right now, uh, there was mention of, you know, people quarantining during, due to pandemics and it's hard to do when you don't have a spare, you know, another bedroom with its own bathroom uh, and you're worried about that. So I think this is really gonna help, um, especially right now during the time of the pandemic to be able to streamline that process. So I'm really excited that uh, VCOG is part of this process. Um, we also um, elected a new uh, chair, Jenny Crosswhite. Uh, who will be the new chair of VCOG. And I look forward to continuing to work with Ventura Council of Governments um, and look at regional issues. And we've got the agenda for next year. Uh, we're gonna look at health issues. Uh, it's a new part of our um, guidance for the next year. One of the topics that we hadn't formally adopted as one of our goals as VCOG, but we are gonna be looking at, at it now, obviously because of the pandemic. So um, that, that's what took place at the VCOG meeting. Um, and then on January 19th, uh, I uh, was at the youth council meeting online uh, with Councilwoman Lister, and um, she expressed her enthusiasm at being a part of youth council. I'm glad to have her uh, her enthusiasm there. And the students, uh, the the youth mentioned um, the youth summit and the um, talent show and how they're going to do that online and what kind of interest there is. I believe that the survey is still open, so if you're interested, if you're a youth and you're interested, please. Um, I think the best way to find out what Youth Council is up to is via Instagram. They are on Twitter, um, and I, you know, they they post on Twitter and Instagram a lot. But those are definitely two of the best ways that you can figure out what Youth Council is up to, what they've done in the past. They've done their Flashback Fridays, which is cool, 
and we can see what they've done in the past. And I want to thank you, Council, for everything that they've done and everything that they're planning to do to connect to our youth during this pandemic, when we've had so many youth feeling so lonely and you know not being able to see friends. So I really want to thank uh, the Youth Council uh, and uh, Kristen Tignak for all the work that they do with the Youth Council. Really appreciate it. Um, and then on January 22nd, we had another elected officials meeting. Um, and just so you know, uh, you know, we are trying to get more vaccines. The county is working on getting more vaccines. Um, there are different tiers, tier 1A and, you know, is, is looking at the healthcare workers. We just lost a doctor, Dr. Schrock um, in Santa Paula who had asked for a vaccine but did not get it and he died due to COVID. So please be patient. It is really important that we vaccinate our frontline healthcare workers right now. They really need to be the priority because um, they're the ones that are helping us through this pandemic. So uh, please be patient. I know people have said, I really, really want the, the vaccine, but we really need to take care of our healthcare workers. Again, who are on the front lines that broke my heart to hear that a local doctor here in Santa Paula had passed away due to COVID, even though he had asked for the vaccine and he did not receive it. Um, and that breaks my heart. So please be patient. Uh, we need to make sure that all of our healthcare workers get their vaccines. And I know that Ventura County asked the state for more vaccines. And I know the state asked the federal government for more vaccines. So it just takes time to get the vaccines and also to distribute the vaccines. So uh, please be patient. They are working on it. Um, uh, just today, they announced that they are going to um, change the stay at home orders and we're moving back to a tiered system. But just a reminder that we are still in the purple tier, the most restrictive tier due to um, what is happening, um, the ICU capacity at our hospitals, uh, we currently have over 80 people in Ventura County in ICUs due to COVID, uh, and we had a number of other deaths. We are now at over 500 deaths in Ventura County due to COVID. So please, please wear a mask. Please um, socially distance. Please do not mingle with people that are outside of your household. Um, we have now identified the more contagious, 70% more contagious strain of COVID that is now present in Los Angeles in our region. Um, and they're expecting that um, to hit uh, come March. So please continue to be vigilant, continue to wear masks, continue to avoid gatherings with people outside your household. Um, thank you, Mayor, that's my report. Thank you. Council Member Litzer. Thank you, Mayor. My report on Tuesday, January the 12th, I had the opportunity to attend um, the Economic Development Committee meeting sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. Wanted to reference um, one of the speakers was Michelle Walden, who is um, the new um, general manager or uh, there at, at our Simi Town Center. And I appreciated her comments of what's happening there. One of the comments she made is that there have been some show of strong leasing happening. And so I thought that was encouraging to know that there appears to be positive growth um, in, and businesses coming to our Simi Town Center Mall. Uh, on Wednesday, and I too, like as um, Councilmember Lovenos mentioned, have attended our briefing, um, the two briefings, but also on Wednesday, January 13th, I attended the Task Force on Business Recovery, and also um, on January 20th, every Wednesday, I'm, I'm part of that task force. Um, they specifically are concerned about local businesses that are struggling and what can be done, notifying them about grant opportunities, um, and there are many now that are, of course, there was the state um, round and there's also the second round of PPP that's going on through our, our federal government. Um, the county is also starting a second round program. Um, and so I want to be sure all of our businesses are really aware of their financial resources and that they don't hold back and apply for everything because we want them, we want them to, to succeed. Um, but just to give you an, idea, an example of some of the struggles, on the 20, for instance, we briefly discussed the isoplex and what the PSPS meant for them as far as power outage and losing the possibility of losing their ice and needing generators, et cetera. So we, um, this has really been a difficult time for our businesses, and, and all that we can do to um, render support would, is, is important. <clears throat> of course, January 18th was uh, Monday, was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and I love that it became a day of service. And so I know many of our residents took part in a variety of excellent service opportunities. I, I actually had the fun of attending a service, an online service, where um, a friend gave a lecture on building resiliency and, 
and going from from surviving to thriving. And one of the, the my takeaways from that was that we can all be resilient. It's like a muscle. We need to work on it. It's not something that just happens, but there are ways to, and she gave a variety of, of ways, meditation, et cetera, different ways that we can build our resiliency. And certainly we all need that, that at this time. Um, on Tuesday, January 19th, as Council Member Lovenos mentioned, I had the um, uh, fun, is, is, uh, all right, fun is okay to say fun, attending a meeting is fun, it certainly was. I had the pleasure of attending the Youth Council meetings, um, twi- uh, meeting, and that was my first, and looking forward to many others. One of the things that I took away from that meeting that I was impressed with is that, of course, they have a, various committees doing uh, exploring different programs, one of which is the anti-vaping messaging. And I was impressed to learn that they have received a $1,000 grant to assist with that messaging. And so looking forward to seeing what that particular committee comes up with to um, to educate our community and and our youth about the dangers associated with vaping. Um, as I mentioned, Wednesday, January 20th, I attended the uh, task force on business recovery. I also had the opportunity of stopping by the Chamber of Commerce and um, picking up masks to, to disperse to businesses and friends, others that needed them. I should say that they have received a large uh, donation from the hospital, et cetera, of masks that can be used. And so encourage if you need some for your business, for your family, on Tuesday and Thursday they have a regular dispersal of these masks, so f- please feel free to, to follow up and visit the Chamber of Commerce. On Thursday, January the 21st, I attended an AWA Association of Water um, Agency um, breakfast Zoom meeting, and um, Eric Bolt from um, you know, AA, the our national, I don't know, um, basically dealing with, um, he's, he, he was a speaker, basically dealing with um, weather and, and all related. And, and the, one of the questions is, what will 2021 bring? And I was very interested to know what we might be facing. Um, I will say that we are in a La Nino um, season and high pressures blocking storm systems. This recent weather we had was truly a blessing but we've been in a very low precipitation drought-like because of this La Nina situation. But anyone who's interested in more information, I encourage you to go to a new website, which is drought.gov, D-R-O-U-G-H-T dot gov. You can enter your zip code, your county, and specifically see what the precipitation levels are like, what, what is anticipated for this year, um, comparing our levels this year to the last 10 years, et cetera. It's, it's very, very informative site, um, and I, it was very interesting to visit that site. Um, as Council Member Lovenos mentioned on January 22nd, we had a briefing um, meeting, and much of it was was uh, talking about vaccinations and the desire for more, and what the takeaway truly is that the county is doing well, getting uh, vaccinations out, to, um, in utilizing whatever they've been given, but they're certainly desiring more from the state and are making regular requests. So we are very hopeful that um, we will have uh, news, uh, good news in the future. Unfortunately, the way the sign-up system has been, they will only put on a number sign up for the dosages that they actually have. And I understand that there has been some confusion and frustration as people have tried to sign up to participate in vaccinations. Um, and they're, and they rec- the, the county recognizes the problems, are hoping that there, there might be a way to make it easier and better, but right now, um, there just isn't an easy solution at the moment. And, and so right now, sometimes you, if you get kicked out, you have to start all over again. It's frustrating, and we recognize it and are sorry. Um, we are certainly advocating for all of the vaccinations that we can possibly get in our community, and we will keep you updated as we receive more information. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Judge. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. On uh, Tuesday, January 12th, I had a phone call with the city manager so he could keep me updated on what's going on in the city. Wednesday, January 13th, I have been attending uh, the regional, or the SCAGS Regional Housing Needs Assessment Appeals Boards. I'm an alternate member on that board. And um, so those have been going on. Uh, I don't think any cities in Ventura County have launched an appeal for the RENA numbers. So mostly they're from Orange County and uh, and outside our county. On uh, J- 
January 13th. I didn't listen to the telephone call about the pandemic, but I did listen to their press conference they held later. On Thursday, January 14th, I attended the League of California Cities Policy Meeting Public Safety Committee. Nothing really new there. We just went over some legislature that's coming down from the uh, state guys, and we're looking at all that stuff. On Later that evening on Thursday, I was the alternate on the VCOG board, and I did watch that. Uh, Friday, January 15th, I attended another Skag Reina Appeals Board. And on Tuesday, January 19th, another Skag Reina Appeals Board. <laughs> and on Friday, January 22nd, I attended, I listened to the uh, local COVID briefing that came on later that day. And I was also in the Skag Reina Appeals Board. That's the end of my report. Mayor Pro Tem. Edie Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mayor. I did not attend any of those SCAG meetings with, with Councilmember Judge. Um, he was busy. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, January 13th, I also uh, attended the um, video conference on updating on our pandemic. And on Thursday, 20, January 21st, the EDC, Ventura County, had our annual board meeting. So from 3.30 th to 4, we actually had a, a, our regular board meeting. And then from 4 on, we did a special presentation. One of the very nice things was, um, I, I've bragged about the EDC various times through through this past year. They have been there for business in, in ways you can't even understand in our county. They've done a tremendous job. So what normally happens at the annual meeting is a show and tell, or you know they highlight different um, businesses. Well, what they did this time was really great. They highlighted all the staff because that staff has been working so hard all year long. And they highlighted the staff, explained what they did, talked about um, who they are, how long they've been there. And it was just really, really super nice to see that. Um, they also highlighted two businesses that have done very well that started out with EDC loans. One was a brand new business. The other one was a business that had been around for at least 10 years. Then they got assistance from the EDC and now have contracts with the Navy and Verizon. So, I mean, they can take a little bit of help and really help these businesses get out there. Um, I was very happy to see all that and to listen to all that. It was very, very um, informative and also very encouraging that there is life after this COVID for our businesses. We're just going to need to help them as much as we can. Speaking on that, being a banker, PPP loans, get out there and fill out your applications, call your banker, get it done. I received a notice today, the EIDL deposits are going to be coming pretty soon. Half of them are coming ACH, half of them are coming checks, so keep an eye out for that. Very happy to say to see that we are going to have limited reopening again in our community. Um, the first thing I got was a text from a family member saying, when are we going out to dinner? So I don't want to do dishes. So uh, I think that's very good news for our um, restaurants and for our businesses. I know every business that I have utilized has done a fantastic job in following all the COVID procedures. They have things in place. Most of them have gone above and beyond to make sure their employees as well as their customers are protected. The last thing I was just going to talk about, oh, I did want to acknowledge that I received a, an email from a group requesting some information on some public records, as well as various other things. And I um, wanted to let you know that I've spoken with the city attorney, and we will look at the public records and make sure that they get back to you for that. And I guess the last thing is going to be, um, I know Mr. Mayor is going to speak about the meeting tomorrow with SCE, so I'll let him do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Busy time. I On Tuesday, January 12th, I attended the Economic Development Committee meeting, uh, virtual meeting uh, with the uh, chamber. And uh, the, the meeting was a, a very general, I, I viewed it as a very general overview of everything that's going on in the community. I mean, it wasn't restricted to the business community. I mean, we got reports on the uh, construction and multi-purpose rooms in the school district and 
just a wide variety of input. Uh, I think there was over 35 people on that meeting. So um, it, it was full of information, very general in nature, what's going on, our, on in our community. The speaker was uh, Michelle Walden from the uh, Simi Valley Town Center. And she was very encouraging. It was great talking to her again and uh, listening to what she had to say. But I think uh, we're, we're now looking at a group up there that is wanting to move forward and they're putting their best foot forward. And I've talked to two, I'm not gonna say everybody, I've talked to two tenants up there and they're thrilled with Michelle and her approach to uh, management and it, it sounds like uh, very, very encouraging what's going on up there at the uh, Town Center Mall. Um, let's see here, get to the next page. On Thursday, January 21, I attended my first ADA Paratransit Advisory Committee meeting, and I wanna thank the staff for leading me through that meeting. That was my first meeting and there were a few people absent and so I got to chair the meeting and um, fortunately, Mr. Gonzalez uh, took care of me and pointed me in the right direction throughout the meeting. And uh, by and large, uh, I think what I got out of this meeting is they're making some um, uh, software changes that are gonna benefit the uh, riders and, and in, Benefiting them, it'll actually benefit the employees too on their routes that traveled. And what, so it's a win-win the way I see it. And they seem to be pretty excited and uh, getting this into operation and they, they feel it'll, it'll work to the benefit of everybody, um, writer and employee, which I think is awesome. On Friday, January 22nd, um, I was, in a uh, discussion with uh, Edison officials, and uh, attending that was uh, Samantha Augerbright and uh, City Manager uh, Brian Gabler. And um, we talked to the Edison folks for probably in the area of an hour and a half. Um, I, I wish I could say that we learned more. I think what we got was the PR report on uh, a lot of reasons why they have these PSPS and all the, the, the difficulties they face. But I was looking for answers. When is this gonna end? And so I kinda kept asking that. Okay, this is all real nice, but tell me some, when's this gonna end? When are we gonna put a stop to it? And I, I don't have those kind of answers, unfortunately. And I, I can tell you that uh, right after that meeting, we had a meeting with, um, Assemblywoman Suzette Valadares, and she is asking the same questions. I was very impressed with her, and that she so quickly got a grasp on what our problems were here. And you didn't have to say a whole lot to uh, Suzette, and then she could recite back to you what your problem was, and she had a full understanding of it and was ready to move forward and ask the proper questions. She's already been in contact with the CUPC and asking questions. And I think that quite likely some of the, the information that came out in that CUPC letter that we all saw uh, was at the urging of uh, Assembly Member um, Valadares. And so I think we're very fortunate that we have someone that can take such a, detailed information and, and make sense of it so quickly. So I was very encouraged with that. Um, with that said, uh, tomorrow uh, we have that public meeting with the CUPC and the CUPC wrote a letter that was very, very detailed and was calling out Edison and gonna require them to start answering questions of why are all these uh, PSPS events taking place and the very bad communications level that's going out to the public and uh, we'll be able to share with them the collateral damage that's being done to our community. And, and that's truly what it is. And my, 
my estimation, my opinion, it's reckless action by Edison is now um, putting our citizens in a very, very bad position. And so hopefully we'll be able to express that all to the CUPC. They are the governing body. We are only a voice as the city. We're only the voice, and that's why we're so fortunate that Suzette Valadares has gotten involved because she's a direct line of authority over Edison via CUPC. So there's some encouragement, but uh, we've got a long ways to go. And I think, let's see here. Oh, um, I think uh, Council Member Lifster uh, mentioned the mask at the chamber. And um, I had a request for mask, and I called the chamber, and uh, I, like 15 minutes, I had like 200 masks to give to this church group that were asking for them. And I, I couldn't believe, you know, how responsive the chamber was. John Tolson, you know, he said, where are you? <laughs> how quick can you be here? We'll give them to you. And uh, so the, uh, the person who received them for the church was amazed because ultimately it was easier for me just to pick him up and drive him to him, his house and deliver him. And, and he, he was astonished that the city provided that kind of service. So um, thank you to the chamber. Uh, I didn't tell him the chamber gave him to him. I, just, <laughs> I said, yeah, the city would really like to give you these masks. <laughs> not really, not really. <laughs> so um, anyway, be aware that they do have a lot of masks. And uh, they're a good tool, and I think we'll be using them for quite some time. And these are quality masks that are available. And uh, uh, give the chamber a call and tell them what your needs, and I'm sure they'll take care of you. And that's the end of my report. Okay, at this time we'll go to 9B. Call for any future agenda items. May I have two requests? Okay. Uh, the first one is with regard to comments that were made by um, uh, during public comments by our residents. Um, uh, I am requesting for um, an ordinance or a report on an ordinance to ban guns or any weapons in city council chambers or on uh, city property uh, with uh, six who died, including two law enforcement officers um, who bravely defended elected officials and their staff. I am concerned um, about uh, threats and there are ongoing threats um, throughout Ventura County, but um, you know, our, our purview is here in the city council. So I would request for a report on uh, an ordinance to ban guns or any weapons in city council chambers with the exception of course, of our law enforcement officers, our own law enforcement officers like uh, Simi Valley Police Department, our own chief Livingstone. The second request uh, is with uh, uh, to use redevelopment funds, which were uh, intentionally given out to create affordable housing to house our homeless. Uh, and by that, either um, uh, to, to build a shelter, because we've seen that there is a, a uh, lack of cooperation or uh, want to house our homeless, even within our, our hotels here with the voucher system. So um, I think we should use our redevelopment funds uh, to create, to, to build a shelter here in the community. Uh, and I think um, given that the reports are all showing that the homelessness is only going to increase, the number of homeless is only going to increase because of the pandemic and the economic fallout. Um, I think it's only correct that we use our redevelopment funds as they were intended to create affordable housing and who else to create affordable housing for than our homeless population. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, uh, Council Member Loevanos, I, I want to confirm with you that you want to agendize the uh, weapons issue? Uh, yes, to, to ban guns or any weapons in city council chambers um, or city property. I'm not sure what, what the legalities of that are, but I know that they are banned in courthouses. Even you know FBI, CIA agents, they're not allowed to take their weapons and they have to uh, leave their guns in a lockbox before they go into the courthouse. The only people allowed in courthouses to have weapons are, um, are bailiffs, and that's how it is in Sacramento, in the US Capitol, and a lot of places around the country. So I wanna make sure that our city staff uh, and our electeds are all safe. 
especially okay. in light of what happened to the U.S. Capitol. Okay, we'll be the second to agendize it, but I'm also wondering uh, if we want to ask staff for a report on that, on what is typically done beforehand. Uh, Chief, can you advise us? I'm bringing the chief down. It's it's not a vote, Mayor. It's just to put it on the agenda and and see what the possibility of is it. Doesn't think yeah, there's there's a uh, micro or a um, uh, metal detector that they set up, and usually only uh, credentialed officers are allowed in with weapons. So, and that's in um, you know courthouses and things like that. So, uh, you know, but it would have to be something that uh, you know here locally we you know we would um, we obviously have officers here and going forward you know because of some of the things that have happened we're going to have officers uh, at most meetings in addition to me so it would just be um, you know uh, typical for our normal security policy but you know that would be something that would be uh, at the city's discretion um, you know in terms of what the rules are we could look I could look at what you know other cities do in council meetings and, and see if there's anything uh, existing in the county that does that but I do know in county buildings and courtrooms and things like that the only people that can come in uh, armed are you know um, on duty uh, peace officers so okay okay so do we have a second to agendize this I don't think we need it on the agenda yet. I'd, I would rather see a report first so then we can decide how we want to move forward with it, whether we want to actually do an ordinance or whether we want to look at tighter security, something along those lines. So we can put together a, um, a report to council boxes and we can go from there. Okay, let's do that and then we will uh, uh, make a determination if we put it on the agenda or not. Okay, Mayor, and my second request was to uh, inquire as to using redevelopment funds um, to house, uh, to build a shelter for our homeless. Who's going to staff that shelter for the homeless? We have a number of partners that said they'd be willing to work with us if we did so, and actually building a shelter would open up a number of funding streams as a number of our, our, of our um, housing advocates have, have stated across the county that the reason why we lack in funding and support in Simi Valley is because we do not have a shelter for our homeless population. So if we actually built a shelter for our homeless population, it would actually open up revenue streams to our city to support our, our homeless residents. Okay, I'll, I, I would like to ask for, uh, again, gosh, I hate doing this to staff, but a report from staff and get an idea of the kind of uh, cost that we're talking and, and unless you already know something. Well, we, we can we can put a memo together. The only um, shelter in Ventura County is in, in Ventura right now. We're familiar with how they they set that up with the um, uh, the County of Ventura as their partner. Uh, they've they've got a million plus costs a year just um, maintaining it. But my understanding is that it's not even. I think they have 50, 50 or fifty five beds that are. They're not. They're never able, able to fill it with a population of over 700 homeless people in in the city. But what well, we can put a mem we can put a uh, report together for council to for, to review and and we can go from cost. there. So we'll do it like we did on the previous one. Correct. Okay. Uh, council member Listener, you wanted to say. Something. I I did. Well, actually, I I have a couple of items for discussion or possibly to put on the agenda. Um, I'm obviously we've all been affected by these recent PSP. Events. I know that there's the meeting tomorrow that where we can listen to the California PUC and hear what they how SE defends themselves. But are we able to? I think we need to educate our residents how they can um, or how they might possibly get reimbursed for and what could be reimbursed for their losses. Like for instance, my company was um, out of power for two days. We were not able to operate. Um, do I, am I obligated to pay for those employees that couldn't work? I mean, who, I mean, can I file for instance? I mean, those kind of questions, it might be nice to, to, um, to edge to help our residents know what their, their, their possibilities are as far as reimbursement for food spoilage, as far as, uh, 
appliances that have blown up as, as power came back on. Um, what, what about lost wages, for instance? Um, okay, can I interrupt you? Sure. Um, I, I was going to bring up myself for 9B that we asked the city attorney to research the legal ramifications and what could be done. Because my understanding is you can file uh, all the claims you want with Edison, but they don't pay them. Is that's what I keep hearing? I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, Ed Edison is no, is not reimbursing for PSPS events, and we've become aware that they're no longer reimbursing for food uh, spoilage as a result of these events as well. Which is one of the issues that we have raised with the um, uh, CPUC in our uh, discussion with them or our letter to them, um, and that's among the issues that we're concerned about is that there is. There's no financial disincentive on it on the Edison's part to turn off or not turn off a circuit, um, especially now since they are not reimbursing for any of those costs as well. And so, so where I'm going, uh, Mr. City Attorney, is is to ask him to come back with what are our options, and and with that, I mean our options as a city, but our options, uh, what we would need to do representing our residents also. Yeah, um, several council members have expressed, including yourself, Mr. Mayor, quite strongly, is there something that can be done? And, you know, offline, we did find, and the city manager also found, the community of Acton became a party to a PUC proceeding, holding, in part, holding Edison to account for its actions under the PSPS, as well as we found Malibu is participating, San Jose, County of Santa Barbara, and a few other entities. So I'm happy to come back with a report giving you options if, for example, if you want to become a party of that proceeding, there may be some advantages to the city to get a seat at the table. So we can outline that and then you'd have to vote to authorize that and then we could file it. So that could be something that for you to consider. Okay, so like our other request, there's no need for a motion right now. It's You'll bring us a report. But in, in that case, I would suggest something on an agenda so that you could actually vote to authorize that if you want to file and become, for example, a party, I would need a vote. So it has got to be on an agenda. Yeah, but it, once we get your report, then we can agendize Absolutely. it, correct? That's, that's right. Well, I, or, you can do that, or we can bring it straight to you if, if you'd prefer. Faster would it be to bring it straight to us, correct? If it just got agendized, and then we would, that sure. would be part of the report. We, we could, I'm, if we brought a memo to you, we could turn it around to the next council meeting. So that's not okay. a problem either. Okay, let's, let's do um, that. But whatever the council prefers, I think, yeah, I think preliminarily, I think uh, city attorney can do the research and get something to you fairly quickly, and um, we could have something to you. It, it could potentially be combined if you wanted that item on what to do with SCE if you wished, but that's up to yeah. you know the mayor and the we, we can okay. pull it together. And, and also, if I could suggest that in that report, uh, while you're doing your work, is um, look at the... Um, procedures and what it would take to do cost recovery on behalf of the city because there's a lot of cost to what's going on here that are, are transferred to the city. Uh, I see the trucks out putting the stop signs up at the intersections. I, I know they're not free. Um, I think the I think I learned that water company uh, people have to go out and turn on pumps. I mean, there's just a, a large, large degree of work extra. And so if you could learn and let us know, uh, I know in the case of fires, we do cost recovery. And uh, we send a bill to Edison for fires that are, and I have to say, I wanna make it very clear, negligently started or recklessly started, not accidental, okay? And so we're not out for, you know, silliness, but, um, and they did pay, they did pay, and they continue to pay as we're finding out Woolsey and these big fires. Happy to look at that option, whether it's through the PUC or whether it's some other way, but happy to at least address what we can find out in the time frame that we have and then keep looking. Yeah, okay. And Mayor, I had one more, um, one more possi possible item for discussion. In that we are now on the purple tier today, as of noon, um, and I'm going, reading through the list of what that means, I noticed that libraries can be open at 25%. And our public library, I recognize we've got a, a very diligent um, uh, remote pickup 
check out books, et cetera. I appreciate that, but knowing that that they could be open at 25% and they've been, it's, our library's been closed for many months. I'm wondering if we can investigate a way that safely we can have it be more available to our residents. It, it, uh, unless there's any, uh, uh, any concerns otherwise, we can certainly look at uh, an approach to open up the facility. I know a staff has already put together a game plan to uh, start opening up the facility um, and Council member, this is correct at 25% now under the purple tier. We can, so we can, we can move down that path. A quick question. Are, to my, on my concern with that is to make sure that we have enough PPE and, and, um, you know, disinfecting and all those things for our staff, make sure that our staff are safe. If we so choose to open that, is that something we could bring back so we could vote on that, whether or not to reopen the library? We, we would not open it unless our staff was safe. We can certainly, okay. we, we have sufficient PPP, PPE. Okay, I'd like, I'd like to see a report on what, what, the, what the safety protocols are. Yes, we will be following the state, state and CDC protocols on opening any facility, just as we would here. So I, do we I, have a report on the safety protocols? Like, has that already been planned out? Uh, our staff has been working on a plan for opening the library which would include that. We'd be more than happy to provide uh, information to the council on that. Okay, yes, I would appreciate that greatly. Thank you. Um, what about, um, do you know, council member, if that would apply to the lobby too? In other words, is it too early to start investigating a partial opening of the city hall? Oh, we've been open. Yeah, we we haven't closed. Our our city hall has been lo oh, it's been open since June, June twenty second. Yeah, so we, yeah, we're we're open. We're still open for business. Okay. Okay. There, there are a number of city halls in Ventura County that are not open, but we have remained open since. Okay. Since June. Do and that I know they're follow, the employees are following protocols. Oh yeah. I, I can only assume that there's a so many people let in at a time, which we probably don't have a big uh, rush. We, we have a very small population that comes into the city hall on a daily basis. Um, that's why we felt safe enough to leave it open. Um, but there is a limit to the library, which is a certain capacity that we would have to follow, that we would have to do counters to count the people coming in, Hi. making sure they're not sitting and relaxing and reading. It's come in, grab your book, check it out, leave. Um, okay. So th there is a whole protocol that we have established in order to do that. We've been working with our contractor, LSI, who runs libraries and other communities. They're very familiar with what needs to be done. So we, we feel confident that with the plan that we already have developed that we could do that. Um, I have I admittedly resisted opening the library over the last several months because of the surge that we've been seeing in, in COVID. But um, I think now with the with the change to the purple tier, it's really something we can take a different look at. Okay, okay. Uh, and just to defend myself, I, I walk in the back door and I go, I go to my office <laughs> and I don't get a rest around the rest of the city hall. I, and I would like to commend that when I go in the back door, I'm greeted by your temperature will be taken. You will report it to the uh, clerk and then you're asked, uh, I think it's four additional questions before you can continue on amongst your business <laughs> in, your own, uh, in your own office. So anyway, that's my way of uh, saying thank you and that you're obviously doing a good job because they could care less if it's the mayor or the city manager or whomever. You're going to get your temperature taken and you're going to answer those four questions. And so far I've been okay because they haven't thrown me out. Not for that. <laughs> so thank you to the staff for, for that work. Okay, I think that's it. Um, moving now to adjournment. Um, we're going back to our old ways of having to adjourn in memory of too many people. So I'll start with uh, adjourned in memory of Lloyd Frew. He's a uh, retired Simi Valley Police Department detective who passed away. Adam Gibson, 
a Sacramento County Sheriff's deputy and his canine, Riley. Officer Brian Sicknick from the United States Capitol Police officer. And here's one that will um, probably grab a few of you. Linda Manios, uh, if you recall the last meeting, we adjourned in her husband's memory and she too had COVID and she too passed uh, due to COVID uh, just a week after her husband. And unfortunately, I don't know, in the same hospital and, uh, locally. So uh, that, that, that family got hit very hard. Um, also, Joanne Dion and uh, it's Monica Dion's mother from uh, Environmental Services. And also on a personal note, uh, I, I want to mention a gentleman that has uh, been an icon in the, this country, and that's uh, Henry Aaron, the home run record holder. And I've watched the bios and all the information on uh, Mr. Uh, Aaron, and what an amazing person. And, I, and I, I guess I didn't really realize his age. And he came into the big leagues in the 50s, and he was probably the second uh, black man to go on to the big leagues. He left the what they called at the time the Negro League. And that guy went through a lot, a lot of discrimination. He saw a lot, and he was the most dignified fellow that you could come across. And he turned that dignified nature of his into unity. And um, I watched some of his old uh, interviews, and the guy was absolutely amazing. And uh, he never ignored the discrimination but he didn't dwell on it to the point where he became obnoxious or anything like that. He, he worked on it in his own way to bring unity. And uh, he said something that I thought was quite profound. He said, um, he goes, the one great thing about baseball is when you walk into a baseball park, he says, it's not black and white, it's baseball players. And I thought that was good. He obviously had a very good sense of humor and then he did an awful lot for the disadvantaged youth that were brought up like himself. He was a, a, came from a very poor family, a very large family in Mobile, Alabama. And, uh, and he went back there and he served those youngsters for many, many years, bringing them up. And I, I thought, um, what he said to one person that was interviewing him many years ago, they said, how would you like to re be remembered? And he says, well, I, I'd kind of like to be known as a good baseball player. And then he says, however, I would uh, much rather be known as a good person. And uh, wow, he accomplished that and then some. So anyway, that's my talk on uh, Hank Aaron, the, the home run record holder. And by the way, I loved what he did. He, he tied the record somewhere in the, up north, and then he actually broke the record under death threats, and he went to Atlanta, and I thought, that perfect, perfect, and he hit the record-breaking home run in Atlanta, and uh, that, he couldn't have chosen a better place to do that. So anyway, my hat's off to Henry Hank Aaron. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.